Hello, and welcome to the online course for the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python book. I'm Al Swigert. I'm a software developer and tech book author. Automate the Boring Stuff with Python is my fourth programming book, and now I've made an online course that follows the book's content. Learn to Code has become a huge mantra. You have sites like Code Academy and Khan Academy and a massive online open courses to teach people to program. You hear things like coding is the new literacy or how everyone in the 21st century will have to learn to code. And if you want to become a software developer, this course can be your first few steps on that path. But what if you don't want to change careers to software engineering? You're still getting these learn to code recommendations from everyone, mostly from people with a book to sell. By the way, Automate the Boring Stuff with Python is released under a Creative Commons license, so you can buy a print or ebook, or you can read it online for free at automatetheboringstuff.com. Is there a reason the average office worker, student, or administrator should learn to code? Yes. Whether you have to send emails, visit websites, or go through a ton of spreadsheets and PDFs, these jobs use laptops and desktop PCs as their primary tool. And sometimes using a computer means spending hours doing tasks that require a bunch of mindless clicking and typing. If you don't have an intern to shuffle this work off to, you should learn to code so that you could program the computer to do these tasks for you. Or if you're the intern, you should learn to code so that you can program the computer to do these tasks for you. So how is this course different from all the other online programming courses? Well, I wrote Automate the Boring Stuff with Python for people who wanted to get up to speed making small programs that do practical tasks as soon as possible. You don't need to know sorting algorithms or object-oriented programming paradigms, so this course skips all of the computer science and concentrates on writing code that gets stuff done. But if you are a computer science student or budding software engineer, this course will be a good first step to develop your toolkit of programming skills. This course uses the Python programming language. Python is the best first language to learn. Many universities are switching their computer science curriculum away from Java and to Python. It has a simple syntax and a gentle learning curve, but it's still a powerful language used in the real world. Google, NASA, Yahoo, YouTube, and even non-technology companies like JP Morgan Chase or Industrial Light and Magic all use Python. So learning to code can increase your productivity, but it's also a fun creative skill. And unlike other creative skills or hobbies, if you have a computer, there's nothing else to buy in order to write code. You don't have to buy paint or yarn or power tools. All you need is some free software called the Python interpreter. Sound good? Let's get started, right now. Open a web browser and go to python.org. You'll need to download and install Python for your operating system. This is slightly different on Windows, Mac, and Linux, so consult the course notes for specific instructions. The one thing you need to know is that you should download a version 3 Python, like Python 3.5, and not a version 2 Python, like Python 2.7. When we say Python, we usually mean either the Python interpreter software that you've just downloaded and installed, or the Python language. Python, the software, comes with an editor program that you type your Python, the language, code into. The editor is called idle. Consult the course notes for how to start up idle on your operating system. Beginning in the next lesson, we'll start writing code using it. I highly recommend that you have idle open and follow along with the videos by typing the examples into it. Don't just sit and watch the videos. It's easy to passively watch the videos and think you understand the concepts. Typing the code builds your muscle memory and forces you to see if you can get the code working. One last thing that you should know from the start. Half of a software engineer's day is spent googling for information. Programming can be complicated, and no one can keep all this information in their head. So don't feel bad about constantly looking stuff up on the internet. That's exactly what professional software developers do every day. So if you get an error message, and you have no idea what it's talking about, a good starting point is copying and pasting this message into a search engine. The first three results will probably be to a website called Stack Overflow which is a great question and answer site. So before asking people for an answer, try to find the answer yourself on the web. One, this will almost always be faster because two, other people have probably had your question and already had it answered. But when you do ask questions, provide as much detail as possible. Here's a few things to keep in mind. Explain what you're trying to do, not just what you did. Your helper can then tell you if you're on the wrong track. If you get an error message, specify the point at which the error happens. What line number does it happen on? Does the error happen every time, or does it just happen randomly sometimes? 
Copy and paste the entire error message and your code to a pastebin site like pastebin.com or gist.github.com. These websites will give you a link to your text, which makes it easy to share with other people. Explain what you've already tried to do to solve your problem. This trims down the list of possible causes and tells people that you've already put some work into figuring things out on your own. List the version of Python you're using. Also, say if you're running Windows, Mac, or Linux, and what version you're running, like Windows 7 or Mavericks 10.9.2. Asking effective questions and knowing how to find answers are invaluable tools on your programming journey. Let's begin. Hello, and welcome to the online course for the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python book. I'm Al Swigert. I'm a software developer and tech book author. Automate the Boring Stuff with Python is my fourth programming book, and now I've made an online course that follows the book's content. Learn to code has become a huge mantra. You have sites like Code Academy and Khan Academy and a massive online open courses to teach people to program. You hear things like coding is the new literacy or how everyone in the 21st century will have to learn to code. And if you want to become a software developer, this course can be your first few steps on that path. But what if you don't want to change careers to software engineering? You're still getting these learn to code recommendations from everyone, mostly from people with a book to sell. By the way, Automate the Boring Stuff with Python is released under a Creative Commons license, so you can buy a print or ebook, or you can read it online for free at automatetheboringstuff.com. Is there a reason the average office worker, student, or administrator should learn to code? Yes. Whether you have to send emails, visit websites, or go through a ton of spreadsheets and PDFs, these jobs use laptops and desktop PCs as their primary tool. And sometimes using a computer means spending hours doing tasks that require a bunch of mindless clicking and typing. If you don't have an intern to shuffle this work off to, you should learn to code so that you could program the computer to do these tasks for you. Or if you're the intern, you should learn to code so that you can program the computer to do these tasks for you. So, how is this course different from all the other online programming courses? Well, I wrote Automate the Boring Stuff with Python for people who wanted to get up to speed making small programs that do practical tasks as soon as possible. You don't need to know sorting algorithms or object-oriented programming paradigms, so this course skips all of the computer science and concentrates on writing code that gets stuff done. But if you are a computer science student or budding software engineer, this course will be a good first step to develop your toolkit of programming skills. This course uses the Python programming language. Python is the best first language to learn. Many universities are switching their computer science curriculum away from Java and to Python. It has a simple syntax and a gentle learning curve, but it's still a powerful language used in the real world. Google, NASA, Yahoo, YouTube, and even non-technology companies like J.P. Morgan Chase or Industrial Light and Magic all use Python. So learning to code can increase your productivity, but it's also a fun creative skill. And unlike other creative skills or hobbies, if you have a computer, there's nothing else to buy in order to write code. You don't have to buy paint or yarn or power tools. All you need is some free software called the Python interpreter. Sound good? Let's get started, right now. Open a web browser and go to python.org. You'll need to download and install Python for your operating system. This is slightly different on Windows, Mac, and Linux, so consult the course notes for specific instructions. The one thing you need to know is that you should download a version 3 Python, like Python 3.5, and not a version 2 Python, like Python 2.7. When we say Python, we usually mean either the Python interpreter software that you've just downloaded and installed, or the Python language. Python, the software, comes with an editor program that you type your Python, the language, code into. The editor is called idle. Consult the course notes for how to start up idle on your operating system. Beginning in the next lesson, we'll start writing code using it. I highly recommend that you have idle open and follow along with the videos by typing the examples into it. Don't just sit and watch the videos. It's easy to passively watch the videos and think you understand the concepts. Typing the code builds your muscle memory and forces you to see if you can get the code working. One last thing that you should know from the start. Half of a software engineer's day is spent googling for information. Programming can be complicated, and no one can keep all this information in their head. So don't feel bad about constantly looking stuff up on the internet. That's exactly what professional software developers do every day. So if you get an error message, and you have no idea what it's talking about, a good starting point is copying and pasting this message into a search engine. 
The first three results will probably be to a website called Stack Overflow, which is a great question and answer site. So before asking people for an answer, try to find the answer yourself on the web. One, this will almost always be faster because two, other people have probably had your question and already had it answered. But when you do ask questions, provide as much detail as possible. Here's a few things to keep in mind. Explain what you're trying to do, not just what you did. Your helper can then tell you if you're on the wrong track. If you get an error message, specify the point at which the error happens. What line number does it happen on? Does the error happen every time, or does it just happen randomly sometimes? Copy and paste the entire error message and your code to a pastebin site like pastebin.com or gist.github.com. These websites will give you a link to your text, which makes it easy to share with other people. Explain what you've already tried to do to solve your problem. This trims down the list of possible causes and tells people that you've already put some work into figuring things out on your own. List the version of Python you're using. Also, say if you're running Windows, Mac, or Linux and what version you're running, like Windows 7 or Mavericks 10.9.2. Asking effective questions and knowing how to find answers are invaluable tools on your programming journey. Let's begin. Welcome to the second lesson. We're going to go over three topics in this video, expressions, data types, and variables. Go ahead and start idle, uh, which is the editor that comes installed with Python. On Windows, click on the start button, type idle. And I have multiple versions of Python installed on my computer, but I'm just going to use idle that comes with Python 3.5. The course notes describe how to start idle if you have Mac or Linux. Idle has two parts, the interactive shell, and if you click on File, New File, the file editor will appear. The interactive shell runs Python instructions one at a time and shows you the results immediately. It's great for just experimenting and seeing what instructions do. The file editor lets you enter Python code for complete programs. There are other editor apps for typing in Python programs. I use one called Sublime Text, and there's another one called PyCharm. But this course will use idle because it comes with Python and there's no additional setup to do and because it's the same across Mac, Windows, and Linux. Now, the interactive shell and file editor windows look really similar so it's easy to get them confused, but you can always tell the difference because the interactive shell will have the triple angle bracket prompt. In this lesson we'll be entirely focused on the interactive shell, so close the file editor for now. Let's begin by typing a simple Python instruction. Type 2 plus 2 and then press enter. In Python, 2 plus 2 is called an expression. It's the most basic kind of programming instruction in the Python language. Expressions consist of values, such as the 2s, and operators, such as the plus. Expressions always evaluate, that is, they always reduce down to a single value. So in this example, 2 plus 2 is evaluated down to a single value, 4. You can even think of the single value by itself as an expression. The expression 2 evaluates to itself, 2. There are several other types of operators we can try out. Type the following. 5 minus 3, which does subtraction and evaluates to 2. 3 times 7, which does multiplication and evaluates to 21. Note that multiplication is done with the asterisk and not the x. If you tried to type something like 3x7, uh, Python would just give you an error. For division, we use the forward slash, so 22 divided by 7 evaluates to 3.14. And there are a few other less common math operators, so check the course notes for them. Now, order of operation rules apply here. Multiplication and division are done first, then addition and subtraction. But you can use parentheses to override the usual precedence if you need to. So let's look at two similar expressions. 2 plus 3 times 6, which evaluates to 20. And then type 2 plus 3 in parentheses times 6, which evaluates to 30. So I have a visualization tool so that we can see how Python evaluates expressions step by step. In 2 plus 3 times 6, the multiplication is done first. So 3 times 6 evaluates to 18 then 2 plus 18 evaluates to 20. Well, the parentheses overrides the multiplication, so 2 plus 3 is done first, and a value just in parentheses by itself just 
evaluates to the value, and then 5 times 6 evaluates to 30. No matter how big the expression is, Python evaluates it until it becomes a single value. Let's use this expression as an example. Uh, open paren, 5 minus 1, close paren, times open paren, open paren, 7 plus 1, close paren, divided by open paren, 3 minus 1, close paren, close paren. No matter how complicated the an expression is, all expressions are just values and operators, and it always evaluates down to a single value. You can see this step by step in the visualization tool. And 7 plus 1 evaluates to 8, and the 3 minus 1 then evaluates, and then the operation inside the parentheses evaluates, and then finally it evaluates down to 16. All of these expressions evaluate to the same thing. You can copy and paste any of these, and they evaluate to the same value. If you type something that Python can't understand, it'll display an error message. So let's trigger one of those in idle right now. Type 5 plus and press enter. You can always test to see whether an instruction works by typing it in the interactive shell. These errors don't damage the computer. Don't worry. Professional software developers get error message while writing code all the time. So don't think that you've messed anything up. All values have a data type. A data type is a category of values, and every value belongs to exactly one data type. So whole number values like negative 2 and 30, for example, are integers. Uh, numbers with a decimal point, such as 3.14, are called floating point numbers. We also call integer values and floating point values ints and floats, for short. Uh, note that even though 42 is an integer, 42.0 is a float. So there's also a data type for text values. These are called strings. When typing strings, begin and end them with a single quote so Python knows where the text begins and ends. For example, type quote, hello world, and quote. And when the plus operator is used on strings, it's the string concatenation operator. Concatenation means joins the strings together. For example, let's type Alice plus string Bob. And this expression evaluates down to the single string Alice Bob. Uh, less common is the multiplication operator for the for string replication, which operates on an integer and a string. This is handy if you have to make a string repeat itself. You can type in the string Alice times three to create the string Alice Alice Alice. Or try this expression, which uses string concatenation and replication. The string hello plus the string exclamation mark times 10. And that will evaluate to a string value that has hello with 10 exclamation marks after it. Your programs can save values to the computer's memory with variables. A variable is kind of like a box that can store a single value. You can do this with an assignment statement. In the interactive shell, enter spam equals 42. And this creates a new variable named spam and stores the value 42 inside of it. So you can think of it as a box with the label spam and it has the value 42 in it. And normally you would give variables names that describe the data they contain. Imagine if you were moving and you labeled all of your boxes stuff. That wouldn't be too helpful. But for these lessons, we just need a generic name. So the words spam, eggs, bacon, and ham are often used in Python tutorials because of the spam comedy sketch from Monty Python. Egg, bacon, sausage, and spam. Spam, bacon, sausage, and spam. Spam, egg, spam, spam, bacon, and spam. Spam, 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 egg, and spam. Spam, spam. You can use variables and expressions anywhere you would normally use values. A variable just evaluates to the value it contains. So when I type spam, that evaluates to 42. So in the interactive shell, type spam equals hello. That will store the string hello in the variable spam. Now when we have the expression spam plus world, oh, whoops. Well, Python does exactly what we tell it to, which is why it doesn't have a space in between these words. Let's try that again. Spam plus and then world with a space in front of it. There we go. 
So this is just regular string concatenation because spam evaluates down to the string inside of it, and then that gets concatenated with the world string. Additional assignment statements can change the value that's inside the variable. The old value is forgotten. Uh, this is called overwriting the variable. So I could set spam to a new var uh, value such as goodbye. This same spam plus world expression evaluates to a different value. So you can think of the old value as just being tossed out and forgotten and the new value being assigned every time we have an assignment statement. Expressions are one kind of instruction in Python, the other kind are statements. Unlike expressions, statements don't evaluate to a single value. Uh, although an assignment statement can have an expression as part of itself. Let's try typing spam equals 2 plus 2. The 2 plus 2 expression evaluates to 4, and so 4 is the value that gets assigned to spam. But we can even use the variable itself to set the variable's new value. Try typing spam equals 10, and then spam equals spam plus 1. This assigns spam a new value. The new value for spam is equal to the current value of spam plus 1. Spam, 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 variable, spam. So, if a Python instruction evaluates to a single value, it's an expression. Otherwise, it's a statement. But mostly we just generically call them instructions or code. To recap, idle is the editor program that you type code into. It has two parts, the interactive shell, which runs code one instruction at a time, and the file editor, where you will type complete programs into. Uh, expressions are made up of values and operators, and they always evaluate down to one value. And every value belongs to exactly one data type. The data types we've seen so far are integers, floating point numbers, and strings. And strings contain text, and they start and end with a single quote character. And values can be stored in variables, which can then be used in expressions anywhere values are used. Welcome to the second lesson. We're going to go over three topics in this video, expressions, data types, and variables. Go ahead and start idle, uh, which is the editor that comes installed with Python. On Windows, click on the start button, type idle. And I have multiple versions of Python installed on my computer, but I'm just going to use idle that comes with Python 3.5. The course notes describe how to start idle if you have Mac or Linux. Idle has two parts, the interactive shell, and if you click on File, New File, the file editor will appear. The interactive shell runs Python instructions one at a time and shows you the results immediately. It's great for just experimenting and seeing what instructions do. The file editor lets you enter Python code for complete programs. There are other editor apps for typing in Python programs. I use one called Sublime Text, and there's another one called PyCharm. But this course will use idle because it comes with Python and there's no additional setup to do and because it's the same across Mac, Windows, and Linux. Now, the interactive shell and file editor windows look really similar so it's easy to get them confused, but you can always tell the difference because the interactive shell will have the triple angle bracket prompt. In this lesson we'll be entirely focused on the interactive shell, so close the file editor for now. Let's begin by typing a simple Python instruction. Type 2 plus 2, and then press enter. In Python, 2 plus 2 is called an expression. It's the most basic kind of programming instruction in the Python language. Expressions consist of values, such as the 2s, and operators, such as the plus. Expressions always evaluate, that is, they always reduce, down to a single value. So in this example, 2 plus 2 is evaluated down to a single value, 4. You can even think of the single value by itself as an expression. The expression 2 evaluates to itself, 2. There are several other types of operators we can try out. Type the following. 5 minus 3, which does subtraction and evaluates to 2. 3 times 7, which does multiplication and evaluates to 21. Note that multiplication is done with the asterisk and not the x. If you tried to type something like 3x7, uh, Python would just give you an error. For division, we use the forward slash, so 22 divided by 7 evaluates to 
and there are a few other less common math operators, so check the course notes for them. Now, order of operations and rules apply here. Multiplication and division are done first, then addition and subtraction. But you can use parentheses to override the usual precedence if you need to. So let's look at two similar expressions. 2 plus 3 times 6, which evaluates to 20, and then type 2 plus 3 in parentheses times 6, which evaluates to 30. So I have a visualization tool so that we can see how Python evaluates expressions step by step. In 2 plus 3 times 6, the multiplication is done first. So 3 times 6 evaluates to 18, then 2 plus 18 evaluates to 20. Well, the parentheses overrides the multiplication, so 2 plus 3 is done first, and a value just in parentheses by itself just evaluates to the value, and then 5 times 6 evaluates to 30. No matter how big the expression is, Python evaluates it until it becomes a single value. Let's use this expression as an example. Uh, open paren, 5 minus 1, close paren, times, open paren, open paren, 7 plus 1, close paren, divided by, open paren, 3 minus 1, close paren, close paren. No matter how complicated the an expression is, all expressions are just values and operators, and it always evaluates down to a single value. You can see this step by step in the visualization tool. And 7 plus 1 evaluates to 8, and the 3 minus 1 then evaluates, and then the operation inside the parentheses evaluates, and then finally it evaluates down to 16. All of these expressions evaluate to the same thing. You can copy and paste any of these, and they evaluate to the same value. If you type something that Python can't understand, it'll display an error message. So let's trigger one of those in idle right now. Type 5 plus and press enter. You can always test to see whether an instruction works by typing it in the interactive shell. These errors don't damage the computer. Don't worry. Professional software developers get error message while writing code all the time. So don't think that you've messed anything up. All values have a data type. A data type is a category of values, and every value belongs to exactly one data type. So whole number values like negative 2 and 30, for example, are integers. Uh, numbers with a decimal point, such as 3.14, are called floating point numbers. We also call integer values and floating point values ints and floats, for short. Uh, note that even though 42 is an integer, 42.0 is a float. So there's also a data type for text values. These are called strings. When typing strings, begin and end them with a single quote so Python knows where the text begins and ends. For example, type quote, hello world, and quote. And when the plus operator is used on strings, it's the string concatenation operator. Concatenation means joins the strings together. For example, let's type Alice plus string Bob. And this expression evaluates down to the single string Alice Bob. Uh, less common is the multiplication operator for the for string replication, which operates on an integer and a string. This is handy if you have to make a string repeat itself. You can type in the string Alice times three to create the string Alice Alice Alice. Or try this expression, which uses string concatenation and replication. The string hello plus the string exclamation mark times 10. And that will evaluate to a string value that has hello with 10 exclamation marks after it. Your programs can save values to the computer's memory with variables. A variable is kind of like a box that can store a single value. You can do this with an assignment statement. In the interactive shell, enter spam equals 42. And this creates a new variable named spam and stores the value 42 inside of it. So you can think of it as a box with the label spam and it has the value 42 in it. And normally you would give variables names that describe the data they contain. Imagine if you were moving and you labeled all of your boxes stuff. That wouldn't be too helpful. But for these lessons we just need a generic name, so 
The words spam, eggs, bacon, and ham are often used in Python tutorials because of the spam comedy sketch from Monty Python. Egg, bacon, sausage, and spam? Spam, bacon, sausage, and spam? Spam, egg, spam, spam, bacon, and spam? Spam, 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 egg, and spam? Spam, spam. You can use variables and expressions anywhere you would normally use values. A variable just evaluates to the value it contains. So when I type spam, that evaluates to 42. So in the interactive shell, type spam equals hello. That will store the string hello in the variable spam. Now when we have the expression spam plus world, oh, whoops. Well, Python does exactly what we tell it to, which is why it doesn't have a space in between these words. Let's try that again. Spam plus, and then world with a space in front of it. There we go. So this is just regular string concatenation because spam evaluates down to the string inside of it, and then that gets concatenated with the world string. Additional assignment statements can change the value that's inside the variable. The old value is forgotten. Uh, this is called overwriting the variable. So I could set spam to a new var uh, value such as goodbye. This same spam plus world expression evaluates to a different value. So you can think of the old value as just being tossed out and forgotten and the new value being assigned every time we have an assignment statement. Expressions are one kind of instruction in Python, the other kind are statements. Unlike expressions, statements don't evaluate to a single value, uh, although an assignment statement can have an expression as part of itself. Let's try typing spam equals 2 plus 2. The 2 plus 2 expression evaluates to 4, and so 4 is the value that gets assigned to spam. But we can even use the variable itself to set the variable's new value. Try typing spam equals 10, and then spam equals spam plus 1. This assigns spam a new value. The new value for spam is equal to the current value of spam plus 1. Spam, 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 variable, spam. So. If a Python instruction evaluates to a single value, it's an expression. Otherwise, it's a statement. But mostly we just generically call them instructions or code. To recap, idle is the editor program that you type code into. It has two parts, the interactive shell, which runs code one instruction at a time, and the file editor, where you will type complete programs into. Uh, expressions are made up of values and operators, and they always evaluate down to one value and every value belongs to exactly one data type. The data types we've seen so far are integers, floating point numbers, and strings. And strings contain text, and they start and end with a single quote character. And values can be stored in variables, which can then be used in expressions anywhere values are used. That's enough of the interactive shell for now. Let's write our first program. In idle, click on File, New File. This makes the File Editor window appear. Uh, enter the following code. I'll explain what it does afterwards. A pound. This program says hello and asks for my name. Have a blank line. Oh, if I print hello world. Print what is your name? A pound. Ask for their name. My name equals input. Print is good to meet you plus my name. Print the length of your name is print len my name. Print what is your age. A pound symbol ask for their age. My age equals input. Uh, print e uh, you will be plus string int my age plus one plus in a year. Save this program as hello.py. Uh, Python programs are just text files that have the .py ex uh, file extension. 
Then click on Run, Run Module, or just press F5 to run the program. Hello world, what is your name? Al. It is good to meet you, Al. The length of your name is 2. What is your uh, age? 30, uh, 26. Yeah, I am 26. You will be 27 in a year. <laughs> uh, I remember when that was true. Okay, that's the entire program. One thing to keep in mind is that Python will start at the first instruction at the top of the program and then move downwards, executing each instruction in turn. Think of it as putting your finger on the top instruction, and as each instruction is executed, moving your finger down to the next instruction. This is just like how you might move your finger along the lines of a book that you're reading. Your finger is called the execution. The execution in, the, in Python starts at the top and moves down. So the first line with the pound sign is called a comment. Python ignores comments. You can use them to write notes to yourself or reminders about what the code is trying to do or what the entire program does. Blank lines are completely ignored by Python. You can just use these to space out your code. In fact, let's add a couple more blank lines, maybe right here, just to group together the code that's relevant to asking for your name and the code that asks for your age. The print function displays the string value inside the parentheses on the screen. So the line print hello world means print out the text in the string hello world. Functions in Python are like mini programs in your program. They contain code that do various things, and for your convenience, Python comes with a lot of them. In code, a function is its name, followed by parentheses, and optionally, Sometimes there are values passed to the function inside the parentheses. In this context, these values are called arguments, but really values and arguments are the exact same thing. This is called calling the print function when we have code like this here. So the next instruction is also a call to the print function. This time it's passing the what is your name string to the print function. There's also a comment at the very end of the line. You can always add comments to the end of an instruction since everything after that pound sign will just be ignored by Python. When the input function is called, Python waits for the user to type some text on the keyboard and press enter. And just like a variable will evaluate to the value it contains, calls to the input function evaluate to the string value of what the user typed. So if I typed in al, when input was called, this my name uh, variable assignment statement would just evaluate to al. And then the string al gets stored inside of my name. Remember that expressions can always evaluate down to a single value. So if al is stored in my name, then this is what that call to the print function looks like. First, my name evaluates to the value inside of it. And then, this is just a string concatenation, so the next step looks just like this. So this is the string that gets passed to the print function call. This next line introduces a new function called len. What len does is it takes a string argument and then evaluates to the integer value of the length of the string, which is the number of characters in the string. Let's just experiment with this function in the interactive shell for a little bit. So I can call the length uh, function and pass it al, and it returns two. Let's say Albert returns six, or length uh, the blank string, and that returns zero. Uh, and then I can just use these uh, these function calls to len anywhere I could use an integer. So I could say, you know, if I typed out my name 10 times, its length would be 20. So then we have some more uh, print and input calls. This time we're saving whatever the user types into the variable myAge. And then we have this line, which introduces the string and int functions. Now this seems really complicated, so we'll just take this one step at a time. The string and int functions return string and integer 
values of whatever you pass them. So this is really handy if you need to convert between data types. So in the interactive shell, you can have something like string of the value 26, and that returns a string value with 26 in it. And if you have to go the opposite route, you can call the integer function and pass it a string value like 1, 2, 3, 4, and it will return an integer value. There's also a float function that you can use to convert something to a floating point value. So if you can pass a string to it, it will return a float value. Or if you pass an integer value to it, it will return a floating point version uh, value of that integer. Notice it has the decimal point and point zero. This may seem pointless, but remember that the input function always returns a string value, even if the string value is something like 26. And we can't do math on a string. That returns an error. First, we have to get an integer value of it. So that's why we pass it to the int function. And just like you can't do addition on strings, you can't do string concatenation on integers. So we're going to have to call the string function, convert that into a string value. This is what the entire last line looks like when, it, when Python evaluates it. First, the myAge variable will evaluate to the value that's inside of it. And then that gets passed to the int function, which returns an integer form of it. We add one to that integer. We have to convert that back to a string uh, value because we want to concatenate it with the other strings next to it. And then after that, it's just the string concatenations. And so all of this just reduces down to this string, which we pass to the print function call, which then gets it displayed on the screen. And that's how the entire program works. Just to recap, the file editor is where you type in code for a program. The execution starts at the top and then proceeds down, executing each instruction in turn. Comments begin with a pound sign and are just notes that are ignored by Python. They're just notes for the programmer. Functions are kind of like mini programs that your program can run to execute some code that does some specialized thing. In this case, the print function has code for making strings appear on the screen. There's a print function for making text appear on the screen. There's an input function for getting text from the keyboard. And there's also a string int and a float function that returns an integer string or float version of the values that you pass to them. That's enough of the interactive shell for now. Let's write our first program. In idle, click on File, New File. This makes the File Editor window appear. Uh, enter the following code. I'll explain what it does afterwards. A pound. This program says hello and asks for my name. Have a blank line, followed by print hello world, print what is your name, uh, pound ask for their name, my name equals input, print it's good to meet you, plus my name. Print the length of your name is print len my name. Print what is your age. A pound symbol ask for their age. My age equals input. Uh, print e uh, you will be plus string int my age plus one plus in a year. Save this program as hello.py. Uh, Python programs are just text files that have the 
.ty ex uh, file extension. Then click on Run, Run Module, or just press F5 to run the program. Hello world, what is your name? Al. It is good to meet you, Al. The length of your name is 2. What is your uh, age? 30, uh, 26. Yeah, I am 26. You will be 27 in a year. <laughs> uh, I remember when that was true. Okay, that's the entire program. One thing to keep in mind is that Python will start at the first instruction at the top of the program and then move downwards, executing each instruction in turn. Think of it as putting your finger on the top instruction, and as each instruction is executed, moving your finger down to the next instruction. This is just like how you might move your finger along the lines of a book that you're reading. Your finger is called the execution. The execution in, the, in Python starts at the top and moves down. So the first line with the pound sign is called a comment. Python ignores comments. You can use them to write notes to yourself or reminders about what the code is trying to do or what the entire program does. Blank lines are completely ignored by Python. You can just use these to space out your code. In fact, let's add a couple more blank lines, maybe right here, just to group together the code that's relevant to asking for your name and the code that asks for your age. The print function displays the string value inside the parentheses on the screen. So the line print hello world means print out the text in the string hello world. Functions in Python are like mini programs in your program. They contain code that do various things, and for your convenience, Python comes with a lot of them. In code, a function is its name, followed by parentheses, and optionally, Sometimes there are values passed to the function inside the parentheses. In this context, these values are called arguments, but really values and arguments are the exact same thing. This is called calling the print function when we have code like this here. So the next instruction is also a call to the print function. This time it's passing the what is your name string to the print function. There's also a comment at the very end of the line. You can always add comments to the end of an instruction since everything after that pound sign will just be ignored by Python. When the input function is called, Python waits for the user to type some text on the keyboard and press enter. And just like a variable will evaluate to the value it contains, calls to the input function evaluate to the string value of what the user typed. So if I typed in al, when input was called, this my name uh, variable assignment statement would just evaluate to al. And then the string al gets stored inside of my name. Remember that expressions can always evaluate down to a single value. So if al is stored in my name, then this is what that call to the print function looks like. First, my name evaluates to the value inside of it. And then, this is just a string concatenation, so the next step looks just like this. So this is the string that gets passed to the print function call. This next line introduces a new function called len. What len does is it takes a string argument and then evaluates to the integer value of the length of the string, which is the number of characters in the string. Let's just experiment with this function in the interactive shell for a little bit. So I can call the length uh, function and pass it al, and it returns two. Let's say Albert returns six, or length uh, the blank string, and that returns zero. Uh, and then I can just use these uh, these function calls to len anywhere I could use an integer. So I could say, you know, if I typed out my name 10 times, its length would be 20. So then we have some more uh, print and input calls. This time we're saving whatever the user types into the variable myAge. And then we have this line, which introduces the string and int functions. Now this seems really complicated, so we'll just take this one step at a time. 
the string and int functions return string and integer values of whatever you pass them. So this is really handy if you need to convert between data types. So in the interactive shell, you can have something like string of the value 26, and that returns a string value with 26 in it. And if you have to go the opposite route, you can call the integer function and pass it a string value like 1, 2, 3, 4, and it will return an integer value. There's also a float function that you can use to convert something to a floating point value. So if you can pass a string to it, it will return a float value, or if you pass an integer value to it, it will return a floating point version uh, value of that integer. Notice it has the decimal point and point zero. This may seem pointless, but remember that the input function always returns a string value, even if the string value is something like 26. And we can't do math on a string, that returns an error. First, we have to get an integer value of it, so that's why we pass it to the int function. And just like you can't do addition on strings, you can't do string concatenation on integers. So we're going to have to call the string function, convert that into a string value. This is what the entire last line looks like when it when Python evaluates it. First, the myAge variable will evaluate to the value that's inside of it, and then that gets passed to the int function, which returns an integer form of it. We add one to that integer. We have to convert that back to a string uh, value because we want to concatenate it with the other strings next to it. And then after that, it's just the string concatenations. And so all of this just reduces down to this string, which we pass to the print function call, which then gets it displayed on the screen. And that's how the entire program works. Just to recap, the file editor is where you type in code for a program. The execution starts at the top and then proceeds down, executing each instruction in turn. Comments begin with a pound sign and are just notes that are ignored by Python. They're just notes for the programmer. Functions are kind of like mini programs that your program can run to execute some code that does some specialized thing. In this case, the print function has code for making strings appear on the screen. There's a print function for making text appear on the screen. There's an input function for getting text from the keyboard. And there's also a string int and a float function that returns an integer string or float version of the values that you pass to them. First, let me show you a kind of diagram called a flowchart. In a flowchart, you start at the start box and then you follow the arrows to the other boxes until finally you get to the end box. You can take a different path depending on different conditions. A flowchart is a good metaphor for how the execution can move around your program. For example, this flowchart shows you a decision-making process for what to do if it's raining. You can put your finger on the start, then depending on answers to these yes-no questions, you can move around until finally you get to the end box. Instructions called flow control statements can decide which Python instructions to execute under which conditions. But before you learn about flow control statements, you first need to learn about how to represent those yes and no options. This involves three things boolean values, comparison operators, and boolean operators. Remember, we've already seen values and operators. Here we're just introducing some new ones, but it's the same concepts as before. The boolean data type has only two values, true and false. Integers and strings effectively have an infinite number of different values. You can just keep making them longer and larger and larger. But the Boolean data type only has these two values, true and false. Like any other value, Boolean values are used in expressions and can be stored in variables. 
just be sure to type them with a capital T or capital F and the rest of the word in lowercase. Next, let's look at comparison operators. Comparison operators are used in expressions just like the plus operator or any other operator. There are six comparison operators, equal to, not equal to, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, and greater than or equal to. Expressions with comparison operators evaluate to a Boolean value. So let's experiment a bit in the interactive shell. 42 is equal to 42. This is an expression that evaluates down to the Boolean value true, because it is, you know, 42 is the same as 42. However, 42 is equal to hello, that'll be false, or 42 equals 41, that's also false. You can also check with the not equal to operator. 2 is not equal to 3, that's true. And then also the less than or equal than operators. 42 is less than 100, that's true. 42 is greater than or equal to 100, that's not true. Um, 42 is less than 42, well, that's false, but 42 is less than or equal to 42, well that's true. Remember, these are just expressions, just like those 2 plus 2 math problems we did before. So that means we can make them as complicated as we want, or we can use variables. Let's say my age equals 30, um, 26, and then my age less than 30 is an expression that evaluates to true. One thing that you should notice in Python is that integers and strings will always not be equal to each other. So if you have the string 42 and the integer 42, those aren't going to be the same. So even if the string has a number in it, it's still a completely different thing from any integer value. However, float values and integer values can be equal to each other. You might have noticed that the equal to operator has two equal signs, uh, while the uh, variable assignment operator just has one equal sign. It's really easy to get these two confused, so here's a good trick just to remember which is which. You can always think of the comparison is equal to operator as being two characters, just like how the is not equal to operator is two characters, the exclamation point and the equal sign. There are also three Boolean operators, and, or, and not. You might have used them in search engines. So let's do some experiments in the interactive shell with the and Boolean operator. The AND operator evaluates to an expression to true if both Boolean values are true. Otherwise, it evaluates to false. So something like true and true will evaluate to true. But if one or both of these are false, then the entire expression evaluates to false. There's a concept called truth tables that enumerate every possible combination of, of these two values. So true and true evaluates to true, and otherwise it's false. The OR operator will evaluate to true if either or both of the values are true. As long as it's not false or false, it'll be true. So true or true is true, true or false. The only time that it's false is when both of them are false. Here's the truth table for or. Everything is true except for false or false, which evaluates to false. And then the not operator just evaluates to the opposite Boolean value. Not true is false, and not false is true. So unlike the and and or operators, the not operator only operates on one Boolean value. So its truth table is fairly simple. You'll often mix Boolean and comparison operators together in the same expression. You can have my age equals 26, my pet equals the string cat. Then we can have a complicated expression like my age is greater than 20 and my pet is equal to cat. This evaluates to true because both parts on either side of the and operator evaluate to true. And that's it for this lesson. We now know everything we need to start covering flow control statements uh, in the next lesson. Just to recap, 
The two values of the Boolean data type are true and false, that's with a capital T and capital F. The six comparison operators are equal to, not equal to, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. Uh, the equals equals operator is the comparison operator. This has two equal signs, while the single equal sign operator is the assignment operator. That's used in assignment statements like spam equals 42 to assign the value 42 to the variable spam. The three Boolean operators are and, or, and not. And is true if both sides are true, otherwise it's false. Or is true as long as anything in it is true. It's only false if both of them are false. And the not operator simply evaluates to the opposite Boolean value. First, let me show you a kind of diagram called a flowchart. In a flowchart, you start at the start box and then you follow the arrows to the other boxes until finally you get to the end box. You can take a different path depending on different conditions. A flowchart is a good metaphor for how the execution can move around your program. For example, this flowchart shows you a decision making process for what to do if it's raining. You can put your finger on the start, then depending on answers to these yes no questions, you can move around until finally you get to the end box. Instructions called flow control statements can decide which Python instructions to execute under which conditions. But before you learn about flow control statements, you first need to learn about how to represent those yes and no options. This involves three things, Boolean values, comparison operators, and Boolean operators. Remember, we've already seen values and operators. Here we're just introducing some new ones, but it's the same concepts as before. The Boolean data type has only two values, true and false. Integers and strings effectively have an infinite number of different values. You can just keep making them longer and larger and larger. But the Boolean data type only has these two values, true and false. Like any other value, Boolean values are used in expressions and can be stored in variables. Just be sure to type them with a capital T or capital F and the rest of the word in lowercase. Next, let's look at comparison operators. Comparison operators are used in expressions just like the plus operator or any other operator. There are six comparison operators, equal to, not equal to, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, and greater than or equal to. Expressions with comparison operators evaluate to a Boolean value. So let's experiment a bit in the interactive shell. 42 is equal to 42. This is an expression that evaluates down to the Boolean value true, because it is, you know, 42 is the same as 42. However, 42 is equal to hello, that'll be false. Or 42 equals 41, that's also false. You can also check with the not equal to operator. 2 is not equal to 3, that's true. And then also the less than or equal than operators. 42 is less than 100, that's true. 42 is greater than or equal to 100, that's not true. Um, 42 is less than 42. Well, that's false, but 42 is less than or equal to 42. Well, that's true. Remember, these are just expressions, just like those 2 plus 2 math problems we did before. So that means we can make them as complicated as we want, or we can use variables. Let's say my age equals 30, um, 26. And then my age less than 30 is an expression that evaluates to true. One thing that you should notice in Python is that integers and strings will always not be equal to each other. So if you have the string 42 and the integer 42, those aren't going to be the same. So even if the string has a number in it, it's still a completely different thing from any integer value. However, float values and integer values can be equal to each other. You might have noticed that the equal to operator has two equal signs. Uh, while the uh, variable assignment operator just has one equal sign. 
It's really easy to get these two confused, so here's a good trick just to remember which is which. You can always think of the comparison is equal to operator as being two characters, just like how the is not equal to operator is two characters, the exclamation point and the equal sign. There are also three Boolean operators, and, or, and not. You might have used them in search engines, so let's do some experiments in the interactive shell with the and Boolean operator. The and operator evaluates to an expression to true if both Boolean values are true, otherwise it evaluates to false. So something like true and true will evaluate to true, but if one or both of these are false, then the entire expression evaluates to false. There's a concept called truth tables that enumerate every possible combination of, of these two values. So true and true evaluates to true, and otherwise it's false. The or operator will evaluate to true if either or both of the values are true. As long as it's not false or false, it'll be true. So true or true true, true or false. The only time that it's false is when both of them are false. Here's the truth table for or. Everything is true except for false or false, which evaluates to false. And then the not operator just evaluates to the opposite Boolean value. Not true is false, and not false is true. So unlike the and and or operators, the not operator only operates on one Boolean value. So its truth table is fairly simple. You'll often mix Boolean and comparison operators together in the same expression. You can have my age equals 26, my pet equals the string cat. Then we can have a complicated expression like my age is greater than 20 and my pet is equal to cat. This evaluates to true because both parts on either side of the AND operator evaluate to true. And that's it for this lesson. We now know everything we need to start covering flow control statements uh, in the next lesson. Just to recap, the two values of the Boolean data type are true and false, that's with a capital T and capital F. The six comparison operators are equal to, not equal to, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. Uh, the equals equals operator is the comparison operator. This has two equal signs, while the single equal sign operator is the assignment operator. That's used in assignment statements like spam equals 42 to assign the value 42 to the variable spam. The three Boolean operators are and, or, and not. And is true if both sides are true, otherwise it's false. Or is true as long as anything in it is true. It's only false if both of them are false. And the not operator simply evaluates to the opposite Boolean value. Welcome to lesson five, which roughly covers pages 38 to 45 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Now that we know about Boolean values, comparison operators, and Boolean operators, we can start looking at flow control statements. The simplest flow control statements are if and else. Open up a new file editor window by clicking on File, New File, and enter the following code. Name equals Alice, if name equals equals Alice, colon, print, hi Alice, and then go back to the original indentation and type print done. I'm going to save this as ifexample.py and press F5 to run it. You can see that this code prints out hi Alice and done. So let's take a look at the if statement first. Here's a flowchart diagram for it. The expression in the if statement is called a condition. Condition is just a name for an expression in a flow control statement but technically a condition and an expression are the same thing. If the condition in an if statement evaluates to true, the execution enters the indented code that follows. If the condition is false, the execution skips the indented code. 
There's a great visualization tool at pythontutor.com that can show us what's happening in this program. I'm just going to copy and paste this program and then click Visualize Execution. We can click forward to step through the program one line at a time. So first, Alice is assigned to the name variable, then the condition is checked and it does evaluate to true, so the execution enters this indented code and prints out, Hi Alice! And then finally it leaves the block of this indented line of code and, print and executes print done. So let's go back and change this slightly. I'm going to change this so that Bob is assigned to name. You can see that this condition evaluates to false now, so the line of code after it is skipped and only done is printed. This indented code is called a block. A block is made up of lines of code that are indented at the same level. The indentation is how Python tells what part is inside the if statements block and what isn't. A block begins when the indentation increases and ends when the indentation returns to its previous level. Blank lines are ignored for the sake of, of looking at what is in or not in the block. So this is how you can tell that print hi Alice is in a block because its indentation is increased compared to the previous line. Here's a small game program that I wrote. You don't have to pay attention to the code, just look at the indentation and you can tell where blocks begin and end. So you can tell here the indentation has increased, so this has started a new block. And then the indentation returns back to normal here, so that's the end of the block. This is the complete block. Right here you can tell a new block has started, and then the indentation has increased again on this line, so this is a block inside of this block. And then the indentation returns to its previous level, so this continues on with the previous block. And then the indentation returns back to zero here, so that's the end of this block. This is all one block, it just contains another block inside of itself. And then looking on, you can see that this is also a block, it just contains this block, this one line block here, and this one line block here. And then another block begins right here. Blocks are also sometimes called clauses, but just like how condition is just another name for an expression, they're the same thing. And as a nice reminder, new blocks begin only after statements that end with a colon, like in the if statement in our previous program. You can also check it out right here. Here's a colon, and it begins a new block here. Here's another colon in this statement. It begins a new block. This colon shows that a new block is starting. In our name equals equals Alice example, if the condition was false, nothing happened, but we can use an else statement so that code runs specifically when a condition is false. Let's create a new program and type in the following code. Password equals swordfish if password equals equals swordfish colon print access granted and hit backspace to get rid of that indentation and type else colon print wrong password and save this as if else example. In plain English this reads as if password is equal to swordfish print access granted, or else print wrong password. Let's copy and paste this into the online Python tutor tool. If the condition is true, then the if block is executed and the else block is skipped. But if we set it so that the condition will be false, then the if block is skipped and the else block is executed. One and only one of the blocks will be executed. So the flowchart for this program would look something like this. You can see that any path from start to end will go through one and only one of the blocks. So with the if else statements, one of two blocks is executed, but you might have a case where you want one of many possible blocks to execute. The elif statement is an else if statement. It lets you provide as many additional conditions to check as you need. Open a new file editor window and enter the following code. Name equals Bob, age equals 3000, if name equals equals Alice, print hi Alice, 
elif age is less than 12 print you are not alice kiddo elif age is greater than 2000 print unlike you alice is not an undead immortal vampire elif age is greater than 100 print you are not alice granny Save this as if elif example, and then let's run this program. We can copy and paste this into the online Python tutor tool to see what exactly is happening. Here the string bob is assigned to name, the integer 3000 is assigned to age, and so now we're at the if statement. This condition is checked and it's false, so it skips that block. Then this elif statement has its condition checked. It's also false, so we skip that. And then here, this is the first true condition that we found, so the execution enters inside of this block. Prints that out, and then it just skips all of the other conditions. You can have as many elif statements follow an if statement as you need, but the order of the elif statements does matter. The execution enters the first block that has a true condition. The rest of the conditions won't even be checked. You can also add an else statement to the end of the chain of elif statements. The else statements block will execute if all of the previous conditions have been false. One last thing about flow control statements. Sometimes you might see code like this. This condition is kind of weird. The name variable is set to whatever the user is typed in, but input will be returning a string value, not a boolean true or false value. But the reason this code works is that the conditions can use truthy and falsy values. Now for strings, the blank string is a falsy value. If a condition evaluates to the blank string, it's considered to be the same as the false boolean values. All the other non-blank string values are truthy values. Let's try running this code. Enter a name, I can type in Alice, and it says thank you for entering a name. Since a non-blank string like Alice is truthy, then this was considered to be a true condition, so it entered this block of code. But if I run this again and enter nothing, the blank string is considered a falsy value, so this condition is considered to be false, and so this block of code was executed. While this code is works and it's a nice shortcut, in general it's better to be more explicit. You should change this line to be something more like if name does not equal the blank string. For integers, the value 0 is the falsy value and every other integer value is truthy, and the 0.0, .0 floating point value is falsy and everything else is truthy. But you can use the bool function to return an equivalent boolean value of whatever value you pass it. This is kind of like the string and int functions that we've seen before. So if we pass 0 to bool, we can see that's a falsy value. Bool returns false. But if we pass any other integer, it returns true. We can do this with string values as well. Hello is a truthy value, whereas the blank string is a falsy value. To recap, an if statement can be used to conditionally execute code depending on whether or not the if statement's condition is true or false. In elif, that is, an else if statement, can follow an if statement, and its block executes if the condition is true and all the previous conditions have been false. An else statement comes at the end. Its block is executed if all the previous conditions have been false. And finally, the values 0, 0.0, .0 and the empty string are considered to be falsy values. When used in conditions, they're considered to be the same as the false boolean values. And you can always see which, uh, for yourself which values are truthy or falsy by passing them to the bool function. Welcome to lesson 5, which roughly covers pages 38 to 45 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Now that we know about boolean values, comparison operators, and boolean operators, we can start looking at flow control statements. The simplest flow control statements are if and else. Open up a new file editor window by clicking on File, New File, and enter the following code. Name equals Alice, if name equals equals Alice, colon, 
print hi Alice and then go back to the original indentation and type print done. I'm going to save this as if example.py and press F5 to run it. You can see that this code prints out hi Alice and done. So let's take a look at the if statement first. Here's a flowchart diagram for it. The expression in the if statement is called a condition. Condition is just a name for an expression in a flow control statement, but technically a condition and an expression are the same thing. If the condition in an if statement evaluates to true, the execution enters the indented code that follows. If the condition is false, the execution skips the indented code. There's a great visualization tool at pythontutor.com that can show us what's happening in this program. I'm just going to copy and paste this program and then click Visualize Execution. We can click forward to step through the program one line at a time. So first, Alice is assigned to the name variable, then the condition is checked and it does evaluate to true, so the execution enters this indented code and prints out, Hi Alice! And then finally it leaves the block of this indented line of code and, print and executes print done. So let's go back and change this slightly. I'm going to change this so that Bob is assigned to name. You can see that this condition evaluates to false now, so the line of code after it is skipped and only done is printed. This indented code is called a block. A block is made up of lines of code that are indented at the same level. The indentation is how Python tells what part is inside the if statements block and what isn't. A block begins when the indentation increases and ends when the indentation returns to its previous level. Blank lines are ignored for the sake of, of looking at what is in or not in the block. So this is how you can tell that print hi Alice is in a block because its indentation is increased compared to the previous line. Here's a small game program that I wrote. You don't have to pay attention to the code, just look at the indentation and you can tell where blocks begin and end. So you can tell here the indentation has increased, so this has started a new block. And then the indentation returns back to normal here, so that's the end of the block. This is the complete block. Right here you can tell a new block has started, and then the indentation has increased again on this line, so this is a block inside of this block. And then the indentation returns to its previous level, so this continues on with the previous block. And then the indentation returns back to zero here, so that's the end of this block. This is all one block, it just contains another block inside of itself. And then looking on, you can see that this is also a block, it just contains this block, this one line block here, and this one line block here. And then another block begins right here. Blocks are also sometimes called clauses, but just like how condition is just another name for an expression, they're the same thing. And as a nice reminder, new blocks begin only after statements that end with a colon, like in the if statement in our previous program. You can also check it out right here. Here's a colon, and it begins a new block here. Here's another colon in this statement. It begins a new block. This colon shows that a new block is starting. In our name equals equals Alice example, if the condition was false, nothing happened, but we can use an else statement so that code runs specifically when a condition is false. Let's create a new program and type in the following code. Password equals swordfish if password equals equals swordfish colon print access granted and hit backspace to get rid of that indentation and type else colon print wrong password and save this as if else example. In plain English this reads as if password is equal to swordfish print access granted or else print wrong password. Let's copy and paste this into the online Python tutor tool. If the condition is true, then the if block is executed and the else block is skipped. But if we set it so that the condition will be false, then the if block is skipped 
and the else block is executed. One and only one of the blocks will be executed. So the flowchart for this program would look something like this. You can see that any path from start to end will go through one and only one of the blocks. So with the if else statements, one of two blocks is executed, but you might have a case where you want one of many possible blocks to execute. The elif statement is an else if statement. It lets you provide as many additional conditions to check as you need. Open a new file editor window and enter the following code. Name equals Bob, age equals 3000, if name equals equals Alice, print hi Alice, elif age is less than 12, print you are not Alice kiddo, elif age is greater than 2000, print unlike you, Alice is not an undead immortal vampire. Elif age is greater than a hundred. Print. You are not Alice Granny. Save this as if elif example. And then let's run this program. We can copy and paste this into the online Python tutor tool to see what exactly is happening. Here, the string Bob is assigned to name, the integer 3000 is assigned to age, and so now we're at the if statement. This condition is checked and it's false, so it skips that block. Then this elif statement has its condition checked. It's also false, so we skip that. And then here, this is the first true condition that we found, so the execution enters inside of this block. Prints that out, and then it just skips all of the other conditions. You can have as many elif statements follow an if statement as you need, but the order of the elif statements does matter. The execution enters the first block that has a true condition. The rest of the conditions won't even be checked. You can also add an else statement to the end of the chain of elif statements. The else statements block will execute if all of the previous conditions have been false. One last thing about flow control statements. Sometimes you might see code like this. This condition is kind of weird. The name variable is set to whatever the user is typed in, but input will be returning a string value, not a boolean true or false value. But the reason this code works is that the conditions can use truthy and falsy values. Now for strings, the blank string is a falsy value. If a condition evaluates to the blank string, it's considered to be the same as the false boolean values. All the other non-blank string values are truthy values. Let's try running this code. Enter a name, I can type in Alice, and it says thank you for entering a name. Since a non-blank string like Alice is truthy, then this was considered to be a true condition, so it entered this block of code. But if I run this again and enter nothing, the blank string is considered a falsy value, so this condition is considered to be false and so this block of code was executed. While this code is works and it's a nice shortcut, in general it's better to be more explicit. You should change this line to be something more like if name does not equal the blank string. For integers, the value 0 is the falsy value and every other integer value is truthy, and the 0.0, .0 floating point value is falsy and everything else is truthy. But you can use the bool function to return an equivalent boolean value of whatever value you pass it. This is kind of like the string and int functions that we've seen before. So if we pass 0 to bool, we can see that's a falsy value. Bool returns false. But if we pass any other integer, it returns true. We can do this with string values as well. Hello is a truthy value, whereas the blank string is a falsy value. To recap, an if statement can be used to conditionally execute code depending on whether or not the if statement's condition is true or false. In elif, that is, an else if statement can follow an if statement, and its block executes if the condition is true and all the previous conditions have been false. An else statement comes at the end. Its block is executed if all the previous conditions have been false. 
And finally, the values 0, 0, 0.0, and the empty string are considered to be falsy values. When used in conditions, they're considered to be the same as the false Boolean values. And you can always see which, uh, for yourself which values are truthy or falsy by passing them to the bool function. Welcome to lesson 6, which roughly covers pages 45 to 53 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. The next flow control statement is the while loop. You can make a block of code execute over and over again as long as the while statement's condition is true. So let's open up a new file editor window by clicking on File, New File, and enter the following code. Spam equals zero while spam is less than five, colon, print hello world, spam equals spam plus one. And we can save this as while example.py. And when you press F5 to run it, the string hello world will be printed five times. This is because spam starts off as zero, and as long as the condition spam is less than five is true, the while loop will keep looping. Inside the while loop, the spam variable is increased by one, and at the end of the loop, the execution jumps back to the start of the while statement and rechecks this condition. And if it's still true, it enters the block again. So this is why the block runs five times, because after the fifth time, spam is set to the value five, and the while loop's value, uh, while loop's condition, five is less than five, would then be false. So the execution just continues on with the rest of the program. When the execution runs through a loop, we call that an iteration. So we say that this while loop iterates five times. On each iteration, the, spamming, the spam variable was increased by one. So let's compare while and if statements. So while statement looks similar to an if statement. You can see right here, here's the original code on the right, and here's the same code except with an if statement instead of a while statement on the left. The difference is in how they behave. At the end of an if block, the program execution continues on with the rest of the program. But at the end of a while block, the execution jumps back to the start of the while statement and rechecks that condition. So if the condition is still true, then the execution re-enters the while block. It keeps doing this and looping around through this code until the first time that this condition is false, and then it continues on with the rest of the program. So let's try writing a new program. Open up a new file editor window, and type in the following code. Name equals blank string, uh, while name does not equal your name, colon, print, please type your name. Name equals input, and then we'll go back to the original indentation, and have print thank you. I'm going to save this as yourname.py and press F5 to run the program. So the very start, the name variable has been set to the blank string. This means that this condition is true because blank string does not equal your name. So now we are here, we've printed out please type your name and the program is waiting for us to type in some code. So I'm going to type in my name, Al, and it's printed out, please type your name again. This is because at the end of this block, the execution has jumped back here and rechecked this condition. Name is now set to the string al, which still does not equal your name. So it's printed, so it's entered the loop again and printed this out and is now expecting me to type in a name. So I could type in Albert, Al Swigert. But until I type your name, this condition will constantly be true, but once name is set to the string your name, then this condition that your name does not equal your name is false, and then the execution continues on with the rest of the program and prints out thank you. <laughs> Little uh, programmer humor there. So here's a flowchart of this program. You can see right here we've initially set name equals to blank string, and here's the while statement's condition. As long as it's true, it will keep looping around. The first time it's false though, it'll continue on with the rest of the program. This is an example of input validation. Uh, when the input function is called, the user can type in anything. 
If you ask the user their age, instead of a number, they could type in Abraham Lincoln or type in a negative number. So loops are a good way to ensure that the program keeps asking the user until they've entered some valid input for your program. Now, there's a certain kind of bug that you can have with loops called an infinite loop. Let's type this into the interactive shell. While true, colon, print, hello. In the interactive shell, you can end a, end a block by entering a blank line. So once I enter this blank line, this code will execute. Whoa, so that's a bug. So since the condition is always true, because the value true always evaluates to the value true, so this loop keeps looping forever. So if you ever get stuck in an infinite loop like this, just press the Control c hotkey. This will cause a keyboard interrupt error to, uh, to happen in your program, and it causes your program to crash and stop immediately. There are two new kinds of statements that can go inside of a while loop, break and continue. The break statement causes the execution to immediately jump out of the loop. It doesn't even check the condition again, it just immediately goes to the first line after the end of the loop. So we can change our program to look like this. Instead of this condition, we can just make this an infinite loop by typing while true. And after here, we can add if name equals your name. And if so, break. So just like before, this program asks the user to literally type in your name, and it will keep looping until you do. In this program, however, we don't break out of this loop when this condition is false, because it'll never be false. True will always evaluate to true. So instead, what we have is we have a if statement, which checks if name is equal to your name, and if so, it executes this break statement. And it's this break statement that causes the execution to immediately jump out of this loop and then continue on with the rest of the program and print out thank you. Here's a flowchart for this modified program that we've made. You can see it still has a loop. In fact, this is an infinite loop. This condition true will never be false. So I've added this X right here. This path will never happen. So the way that we break out of this loop is by checking this if statements condition if name equals equals your name, and if so, it executes that break statement, which then causes the execution to move beyond this while loop. So in this case, the code doesn't really do anything new, but break statements are pretty useful if you have several different places inside of a while loop that could possibly cause the execution to leave from that point. Like break statements, continue statements are also used inside loops. When the program execution reaches a continue statement, the execution immediately jumps back to the start of the loop and reevaluates the loop's condition. Let's create a new program really quickly that says spam equals zero, while spam is less than five, colon, increment spam by one. We have this one if statement here that checks if spam is equal to three. In that case, we'll execute a continue statement. And then after that, print spam is, and we'll just display the value of spam. Actually, since this is an integer, we're going to have to get the string version of that before we can do string concatenation with spam is. So I'm going to save this and then press F5 to run it. You can see the output is spam1, spam2, and then spam3 is missing. That's because on that iteration, when spam is set to 3, this condition is true, and the continue statement is executed. So when continue is executed, the execution immediately jumps back to the start of the while loop. So in that case, this print function call never happens. And so that's why you see spam is, whatever the value is, for everything, except in that case, spam was equal to 3, because we hit this continue block, and so we didn't reach this part, we just immediately went back to the start. To recap, while statements are similar to if statements, except that once the execution reaches the end of a while statements block, it jumps back to the start and rechecks the condition. If you ever get stuck in a loop, or you just want to quickly terminate your Python program, you can just press Control c A break statement will cause the execution to immediately leave the loop without rechecking the, the condition. And a continue statement will cause the execution to immediately jump back to the start of a loop and recheck the condition.
Welcome to Lesson 6, which roughly covers pages 45 to 53 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. The next flow control statement is the while loop. You can make a block of code execute over and over again as long as the while statement's condition is true. So let's open up a new file editor window by clicking on File, New File, and enter the following code. Spam equals zero, while spam is less than five, colon, print hello world spam equals spam plus one and we can save this as while example dot pi and when you press f5 to run it the string hello world will be printed five times this is because spam starts off as zero and as long as the condition spam is less than five is true the while loop will keep looping. Inside the while loop, the spam variable is increased by one, and at the end of the loop, the execution jumps back to the start of the while statement and rechecks this condition. And if it's still true, it enters the block again. So this is why the block runs five times, because after the fifth time, spam is set to the value five, and the while loop's value, uh, while loop's condition five is less than five would then be false. So the execution just continues on with the rest of the program. When the execution runs through a loop, we call that an iteration. So we say that this while loop iterates five times. On each iteration, the, spamming, the spam variable was increased by one. So let's compare while and if statements. So while statement looks similar to an if statement. You can see right here, here's the original code on the right. And here's the same code except with an if statement instead of a while statement on the left. The difference is in how they behave. At the end of an if block, the program execution continues on with the rest of the program. But at the end of a while block, the execution jumps back to the start of the while statement and rechecks that condition. So if the condition is still true, then the execution re-enters the while block. It keeps doing this and looping around through this code until the first time that this condition is false, and then it continues on with the rest of the program. So let's try writing a new program. Open up a new file editor window, and type in the following code. Name equals blank string, uh, while name does not equal your name, colon, print, please type your name. Name equals input, and then we'll go back to the original indentation and have print thank you. I'm going to save this as yourname.py and press F5 to run the program. So the very start, the name variable has been set to the blank string. This means that this condition is true because blank string does not equal your name. So now we are here we've printed out please type your name and the program is waiting for us to type in some code. So I'm gonna type in my name, Al, and it's printed out please type your name again. This is because at the end of this block, the execution has jumped back here and rechecked this condition. Name is now set to the string Al, which still does not equal your name. So it's printed, so it's entered the loop again and printed this out and is now expecting me to type in a name. So I could type in Albert, Al Swigert. But until I type your name, this condition will constantly be true. But once name is set to the string your name, then this condition that your name does not equal your name is false. And then the execution continues on with the rest of the program and prints out thank you. <laughs> Little uh, programmer humor there. So here's a flow chart of this program. You can see right here, we've initially set name equals to blank string. And here's the while statement's condition. As long as it's true, it will keep looping around. The first time it's false though, it'll continue on with the rest of the program. This is an example of input validation. Uh, when the input function is called, the user can type in anything. If you ask the user their age, instead of a number, they could type in Abraham Lincoln or type in a negative number. So loops are a good way to ensure that the program keeps asking the user until they've entered some valid input for your program. Now, there's a certain kind of bug that you can have with loops called an infinite loop. 
Let's type this into the interactive shell. While true colon print hello. In the interactive shell, you can end a, end a block by entering a blank line. So once I enter this blank line, this code will execute. Whoa, so that's a bug. So since the condition is always true, because the value true always evaluates to the value true, so this loop keeps looping forever. So if you ever get stuck in an infinite loop like this, just press the control C hotkey. This will cause a keyboard interrupt error to, uh, to happen in your program, and it causes your program to crash and stop immediately. There are two new kinds of statements that can go inside of a while loop, break and continue. The break statement causes the execution to immediately jump out of the loop. It doesn't even check the condition again, it just immediately goes to the first line after the end of the loop. So we can change our program to look like this. Instead of this condition, we can just make this an infinite loop by typing while true. And after here, we can add if name equals your name. And if so, break. So just like before, this program asks the user to literally type in your name, and it will keep looping until you do. In this program, however, we don't break out of this loop when this condition is false, because it'll never be false. True will always evaluate to true. So instead, what we have is we have a if statement, which checks if name is equal to your name, and if so, it executes this break statement. And it's this break statement that causes the execution to immediately jump out of this loop and then continue on with the rest of the program and print out thank you. Here's a flowchart for this modified program that we've made. You can see it still has a loop. In fact, this is an infinite loop. This condition true will never be false. So I've added this X right here. This path will never happen. So the way that we break out of this loop is by checking this if statements condition if name equals equals your name, and if so, it executes that break statement, which then causes the execution to move beyond this while loop. So in this case, the code doesn't really do anything new, but break statements are pretty useful if you have several different places inside of a while loop that could possibly cause the execution to leave from that point. Like break statements, continue statements are also used inside loops. When the program execution reaches a continue statement, the execution immediately jumps back to the start of the loop and reevaluates the loop's condition. Let's create a new program really quickly that says spam equals zero, while spam is less than five, colon, increment spam by one. We have this one if statement here that checks if spam is equal to three. In that case, we'll execute a continue statement. And then after that, print spam is, and we'll just display the value of spam. Actually, since this is an integer, we're going to have to get the string version of that before we can do string concatenation with spam is. So I'm going to save this and then press F5 to run it. You can see the output is spam1, spam2, and then spam3 is missing. That's because on that iteration, when spam is set to 3, this condition is true, and the continue statement is executed. So when continue is executed, the execution immediately jumps back to the start of the while loop. So in that case, this print function call never happens. And so that's why you see spam is, whatever the value is, for everything, except in that case, spam was equal to three, because we hit this continue block, and so we didn't reach this part, we just immediately went back to the start. To recap, while statements are similar to if statements, except that once the execution reaches the end of a while statements block, it jumps back to the start and rechecks the condition. If you ever get stuck in a loop, or you just want to quickly terminate your Python program, you can just press Control C. A break statement will cause the execution to immediately leave the loop without rechecking the, the condition. And a continue statement will cause the execution to immediately jump back to the start of a loop and recheck the condition. Welcome to Lesson 7, which roughly covers pages 53 to 60 of the in Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Now, there's a second kind of loop called a for loop. So instead of looping as long as a certain condition is true, like the while loop does, a for loop iterates a specific number of times. 
Let's open a new file editor window by clicking on File, New File, and type in the following code. Print my name is 4i in range 5 colon. Print Jimmy five times plus string i. I'll just save this as 5 times.py and press F5 to run this program. And the output looks like this. My name is Jimmy five times, Jimmy five times, Jimmy five times, Jimmy five times, Jimmy five times. So the code in the for loops clause is run five times. The first time it's run, the variable i is set to zero. The print call in the clause will print Jimmy five times zero. After Python finishes the iteration through all of the code inside this clause, the execution goes back to the top of the loop, and the for statement will set the i variable to 1. And then on the next time, i is set to 2, then i is set to 3, all the way up to, but not including, 5. So as another for loop example, consider this story about the mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss. When Gauss was a boy, a teacher wanted to give the class some busy work, so we told them to add up all the numbers from 0 to 100. So 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3, all the way up to 100. Young Goss came up with a clever trick to figure out the answer in a few seconds, but you can write a Python program with a for loop to do this calculation for you. Let's just start off with total equals zero, and have a for loop for num in range 101, because it goes up to but not including the number that is passed to the range function call. And in here, we'll just say total is equal to total plus that number. And then at the very end, print out total. The result should be 5050. When the program first starts, the total variable is set to zero. The for loop then executes total equals total plus num for every integer from zero to 100 being set in num. There's a hundred iterations through this loop. And then finally, at the end, the total variable is printed to the string. Even on the slowest computers, this program takes less than a second to complete. Just to go back to young Carl in our example, he figured out as a boy that really, to add up all the numbers from 0 to 100, there's really just 50 pairs of sums that equal 100. There's 1 plus 99, 2 plus 98, 3 plus 97, and all the way up to 49 plus 51. So this meant there's 50 pairs of sums of 100. So you just type multiply 50 by 100 to get 5,000, and then you add that middle 50 in as well to get 5,050. Pretty clever kid. A for loop isn't necessarily anything that's new. You can actually use a while loop to do the same thing as a for loop. Uh, it's just that the for loop is more concise for what it's good for. Let's rewrite 5 times.py to use a while loop equivalent of a for loop. So instead of this, I'll just comment that out. We add i is equal to 0, while i is less than 5. And then at the very end of this block, add i is equal to i plus 1. By using a for loop, we don't have to remember to add these extra lines at the beginning and the very end. So let's take a look at that range function in the interactive shell. You can type something like range 10, and it returns a value that's called a range object. This is of the range data type. Now some functions can be called with multiple arguments separated by a comma, and range is one of these functions. So this lets you change uh, integers to range to follow any sequence of integers, including at starting at numbers other than zero. So consider this for loop, for example. Instead of five, which will go from zero to four, you can say 12 comma 16. And when we run this, it starts, the for loop starts at 12 and goes up to, but not including 16. So it goes up to 15. So with two arguments, the first argument is where the for loop variable will start, 
and the second one is the same as the previously where it goes up to but does not include this value. The range function can also be called with three arguments. So in this case, the first two arguments will be the start and stop values, just like in the two argument version. And the third is what is called a step argument. So the step is the amount that the variable is increased after each iteration. So we could have something like zero to 10, or rather zero up to but not including 10. Instead of increasing by one each time, we could have it increase by two. You can even use a negative number here to have the, for the step argument to make the for loop count down instead of counting up, in which case we probably want something like start at five and stop at negative one. Note that you can also use break and continue statements inside for loops, and they work just as the same as they do in while loops. So to recap, for loops are used for when you need to loop a certain number of times. The range function, called with one argument, will loop that number of times. Range 5 will loop 5 times. The variable in the for loop will start off at 0 and then go up to, but not including 5. The range function called with two arguments, you can set a starting integer and the ending integer. So instead of 0, you can have it start at 3 or 2. And the range function called with three arguments has a start, end, but also a new step argument, which is how much the for loops variable increases on each iteration. And you can also use break and continue statements inside for loops, just like you can use them inside of while loops. Welcome to lesson seven, which roughly covers pages 53 to 60 of the in automate the boring stuff with Python textbook. Now there's a second kind of loop called a for loop. So instead of looping as long as a certain condition is true, like the while loop does, a for loop iterates a specific number of times. Let's open a new file editor window by clicking on file, new file, and type in the following code. Print my name is for i in range 5 colon print jimmy five times plus string i. I'll just save this as five times.py and press F5 to run this program. And the output looks like this. My name is jimmy five times, jimmy five times, jimmy five times, jimmy five times, jimmy five times. So the code in the for loops clause is run five times. The first time it's run, the variable i is set to zero. The print call in the clause will print jimmy five times zero. After Python finishes the iteration through all of the code inside this clause, the execution goes back to the top of the loop, and the for statement will set the i variable to one. And then on the next time, i is set to two, then i is set to three, all the way up to, but not including, five. So as another for loop example, consider this story about the mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss. When Gauss was a boy, a teacher wanted to give the class some busy work, so he told them to add up all the numbers from 0 to 100. So 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3, all the way up to 100. Young Gauss came up with a clever trick to figure out the answer in a few seconds, but you can write a Python program with a for loop to do this calculation for you. Let's just start off with total equals zero and have a for loop for num in range 101 because it goes up to but not including the number that is passed to the range function call. And in here we'll just say total is equal to total plus that number. And then at the very end, print out total. The result should be 5050. When the program first starts, the total variable is set to zero. The for loop then executes total equals total plus num for every integer from zero to 100 being set in num. There's 100 iterations through this loop. And then finally, at the end, the total variable is printed to the string. Even on the slowest computers, this program takes less than a second to complete. Just to go back to 
young Carl in our example, he figured out as a boy that really to add up all the numbers from 0 to 100, there's really just 50 pairs of sums that equal 100. There's 1 plus 99, 2 plus 98, 3 plus 97, and all the way up to 49 plus 51. So this meant there's 50 pairs of sums of 100. So you just type multiply 50 by 100 to get 5,000, and then you add that middle 50 in as well to get 5,050. Pretty clever kid. A for loop isn't necessarily anything that's new. You can actually use a while loop to do the same thing as a for loop. Uh, it's just that the for loop is more concise for what it's good for. Let's rewrite 5 times.py to use a while loop equivalent of a for loop. So instead of this, I'll just comment that out. We add i is equal to 0, while i is less than 5. And then at the very end of this block, add i is equal to i plus 1. By using a for loop, we don't have to remember to add these extra lines at the beginning and the very end. So let's take a look at that range function in the interactive shell. You can type something like range 10, and it returns a value that's called a range object. This is of the range data type. Now some functions can be called with multiple arguments separated by a comma, and range is one of these functions. So this lets you change uh, integers to range to follow any sequence of integers, including at starting at numbers other than zero. So consider this for loop, for example. Instead of 5, which will go from 0 to 4, you can say 12, 16. And when we run this, it starts, the for loop starts at 12 and goes up to, but not including 16, so it goes up to 15. So with two arguments, the first argument is where the for loop variable will start, and the second one is the same as the previously, where it goes up to, but does not include this value. The range function can also be called with three arguments. So in this case, the first two arguments will be the start and stop values, just like in the two argument version. And the third is what is called a step argument. So the step is the amount that the variable is increased after each iteration. So we could have something like 0 to 10, or rather 0 up to but not including 10. Instead of increasing by 1 each time, we could have it increase by 2. You can even use a negative number here to have the for the step argument to make the for loop count down instead of counting up, in which case we probably want something like start at 5 and stop at negative 1. Note that you can also use break and continue statements inside for loops, and they work just as the same as they do in while loops. So to recap, for loops are used for when you need to loop a certain number of times. The range function, called with one argument, will loop that number of times. Range 5 will loop 5 times. The variable in the for loop will start off at 0 and then go up to, but not including 5. The range function, called with two arguments, you can set a starting integer and the ending integer. So instead of 0, you can have it start at 3 or 2. And the range function called with three arguments has a start, end, but also a new step argument, which is how much the for loops variable increases on each iteration. And you can also use break and continue statements inside for loops, just like you can use them inside of while loops. Welcome to Lesson 8, which roughly covers the beginning of Chapter 3 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. All Python programs can call a basic set of functions called built-in functions. These include the print function, input, and length, which you've seen before. But Python also comes with a set of modules called the standard library. Each module is a Python program that contains a related group of functions that can be used in your programs. For example, the math module has mathematics related functions, the random module has random number related functions, and so on. Before you can use the functions in a module, you must import the module with an import statement. For example, in the interactive shell, you can import the random module to call its randint function. So we can type random uh, import random. 
and then call the randint function by typing random dot randint, which returns a random integer between the two values we pass it. So a random integer between one and 10. You can call this several times. It'll keep returning some random integer between one and 10. So since the randint function is inside the random module, you have to first type random dot in front of the function name to tell Python to look inside this module for this function. Randint isn't a built-in function. It only exists inside the random module, which is why you have to have the module name in front of it when you call it. You can import a bunch of other modules. There's a lot of modules in the Python standard library, and you can import multiple ones by just separating them with a comma, a comma in the import statement. So I can import the sys and os and math modules all at the same time by separating them with commas. So there's an alternative form of the import statement. You can try typing this in from random import star. Star in this case just means import everything. So this also imports the random module, but now you don't have to type random dot in order to call the random modules function. So I can just type rand int 1 comma 10 to call that function. However, using the full name makes for more readable code since you can tell that, oh, this function is inside the random module. It's better to use the normal form of the import statement than this from random import star format. And the last flow control concept we're going to cover is how to terminate a program early. This always happens if the program execution reaches the bottom of the instructions, but sometimes you want it to stop before that. So you can do this by calling the sys.exit function. First you would have to import sys and then call sys.exit. Of course that doesn't really do anything in the, in the interactive shell, so let's open up a new file editor by clicking on file, new file. So type the following code in. Import sys to import the sys module. You can have something like print hello, and then call sys.exit. And after that, you can have print goodbye. So once the exit function is called, the program will terminate. So this, tech, this code right here will never execute. The execution never reaches there because it stops right here. So when I run this, uh, sysexit.py. You can see it prints out hello, but it doesn't print out goodbye. So Python comes with several modules as part of its standard library, but you can also install new modules to add on functionality. These are called third-party modules, and you can install them using the pip program, which also comes with Python. So the pip program must be run from the command line, also called the terminal. And this is different for Windows, Mac, and Linux, so consult the course notes for how to do this for your operating system. The course material and Appendix A of the Automate book has details for how to install third-party modules. So automatetheboringstuff.com slash Appendix A. So go ahead and use the pip program to install Piperclip. This is a module that gives you the ability to copy and paste text to and from the clipboard. So after it's installed, let's just run import piperclip. Now if no error appears, then you've installed it correctly. But if you see an error that says something like import error, then retry installing the piperclip module. I'm going to do that real quick. and try importing it again. So Piperclip has a copy and paste function for copying and pasting text. And I can run it by typing piperclip.copy. Let's say I want to copy the text hello world to the clipboard. And I can also get the text that's currently on the clipboard by calling piperclip.paste, which returns whatever the text on the clipboard is. And you can see that the hello world text is on the clipboard by just pasting it into the interactive shell. So using the clipboard will be a great way to input large amounts of text into your program and also receive text from your programs as well. So to recap, 
you can run an import statement like import random to import modules and get access to new functions. The modules that come with Python are called the standard library, but you can also install third-party modules as well using the pip tool. And the sys.exit function will immediately quit your program. And the PiperClip third-party module has copy and paste functions for reading and writing text to the clipboard. We're going to be using the PiperClip module a lot in this course. Welcome to Lesson 8, which roughly covers the beginning of Chapter 3 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. All Python programs can call a basic set of functions called built-in functions. These include the print function, input, and length, which you've seen before. But Python also comes with a set of modules called the standard library. Each module is a Python program that contains a related group of functions that can be used in your programs. For example, the math module has mathematics related functions, the random module has random number related functions, and so on. Before you can use the functions in a module, you must import the module with an import statement. For example, in the interactive shell, you can import the random module to call its randint function. So we can type random uh, import random and then call the randint function by typing random dot randint, which returns a random integer between the two values we pass it. So a random integer between one and 10. We can call this several times. It'll keep returning some random integer between one and 10. So since the randint function is inside the random module, you have to first type random dot in front of the function name to tell Python to look inside this module for this function. Randint isn't a built-in function. It only exists inside the random module, which is why you have to have the module name in front of it when you call it. You can import a bunch of other modules. There's a lot of modules in the Python standard library, and you can import multiple ones by just separating them with a comma comma in the import statement. So I can import the sys and os and math modules all at the same time by separating them with commas. So there's an alternative form of the import statement. You can try typing this in from random import star. Star in this case just means import everything. So this also imports the random module, but now you don't have to type random dot in order to call the random modules function. So I can just type rand int 1 comma 10 to call that function. However, using the full name makes for more readable code since you can tell that, oh, this function is inside the random module. It's better to use the normal form of the import statement than this from random import star format. And the last flow control concept we're going to cover is how to terminate a program early. This always happens if the program execution reaches the bottom of the instructions, but sometimes you want it to stop before that. So you can do this by calling the sys.exit function. First you would have to import sys and then call sys.exit. Of course that doesn't really do anything in the, intera in the interactive shell, so let's open up a new file editor by clicking on file new file. So type the following code in, import sys to import the sys module, you can have something like print hello, and then call sys.exit, and after that you can have print goodbye. So once the exit function is called, the program will terminate, so this, tech, this code right here will never execute. The execution never reaches there because it stops right here. So when I run this, uh, sysexit.py. You can see it prints out hello, but it doesn't print out goodbye. So Python comes with several modules as part of its standard library, but you can also install new modules to add on functionality. These are called third-party modules, and you can install them using the pip program, which also comes with Python. So the pip program must be run from the command line, also called the terminal. And this is different for Windows, Mac, and Linux, so consult the course notes for how to do this for your operating system. The course material and Appendix A of the Automate book has details for how to install third-party modules. So automatetheboringstuff.com slash Appendix A. So go ahead and use the PIP program to install PiperClip. This is a module that gives you the ability to copy and paste text to and from the clipboard. 
So after it's installed, let's just run import Piper Clip. Now, if no error appears, then you've installed it correctly. But if you see an error that says something like import error, then retry installing the Piper Clip module. I'm going to do that real quick. and try importing it again. So Piperclip has a copy and paste function for copying and pasting text. And I can run it by typing piperclip.copy. Let's say I want to copy the text, hello world, to the clipboard. And I can also get the text that's currently on the clipboard by calling piperclip.paste, which returns whatever the text on the clipboard is. And you can see that the hello world text is on the clipboard by just pasting it into the interactive shell. So using the clipboard will be a great way to input large amounts of text into your program and also receive text from your programs as well. So to recap, you can run an import statement like import random to import modules and get access to new functions. The modules that come with Python are called the standard library, but you can also install third-party modules as well using the pip tool. And the sys.exit function will immediately quit your program. And the Piperclip third-party module has copy and paste functions for reading and writing text to the clipboard. We're going to be using the Piperclip module a lot in this course. Welcome to Lesson 9, which roughly covers pages 61 to 66 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. There's three parts to this lesson, functions, the none value, and keyword arguments. You're already familiar with the print, input, and len functions from the previous lessons. Python provides several built-in functions like these, but you can also write your own functions. A function is like a mini-program within a program. It contains code that executes when the function is called, just like your program contains code that executes when the program is run. Let's look at an example by opening a new file editor window. I'll type def hello to define this new function called hello, and the code inside of it will be print howdy, print howdy, print hello there. And then I'll call this function three times. Save it as example. And press F5 to run it. This code uses a def statement to define a new function called hello. The code in the block that follows the def statement is the body of the function. Whenever we call the hello function, the execution moves to the top of this function and executes the code inside of it. I'm going to copy and paste this code into the visualization tool at pythontutor.com so we can see what this does better. Visualize execution. You can see that the def statement only defines a function. It doesn't execute the code inside of it. The execution skips its block when the function is first defined. The code inside the function only runs when the function is called. At that point, the execution moves inside of the function and then moves down as normal. At the very end, the execution returns to the function call and then proceeds down to the next line. Here we call it again, so the execution moves into the hello function again. And then we call it a third time and the execution moves into the hello function again. The main purpose of functions is to group code that gets executed multiple times. Without a function defined, you would have to copy and paste this code each time, and the program would look like this. Copy and paste, and copy and paste, and copy and paste. In general, you always want to avoid duplicating code, because if you ever decide to update the code, if, for example, you find a bug that you need to fix, you'll have to remember to change the code everywhere you copied it. As you get more programming experience, you'll often find yourself deduplicating code, which means to get rid of duplicated or copied and pasted code. 
deduplication makes your programs shorter, easier to read, and easier to update. When you call the print or len function, you pass in values called arguments. These arguments go in between the parentheses. So let's change the code in the Python tutor tool and type in the following to add arguments to our code. We'll add name here in between the parentheses and then add the code print hello plus name. And then we'll call it twice. The first time we'll pass the string Alice and the second time we'll pass the string Bob. So in between the def statements parentheses is the name variable, which in this context is called a parameter. When the function is called, the name parameter is assigned the argument that is passed. So we'll define the function, and then we call the hello function, passing the Alice string as the argument. This argument gets assigned to the name parameter, and then we just execute the code inside the function. On the second call to the hello function, we pass the string Bob as the argument. The argument gets assigned to the name parameter, and then we execute it as normal. Just to get the terminology straight, the strings Alice and Bob, these values, are called arguments, while the variable here is called a parameter. When you call the len function and pass it an argument such as the string hello, the function call evaluates to the integer value 5, which is the length of the string you passed it. Function calls can be part of expressions because they evaluate to the value returned by the function call. Let's try the expression hello has plus call the string function, call the len function, and pass it hello plus letters in it. This expression evaluates down to this string. It has these two function calls in it. We'll use this expression of uh, demonstration tool to show you what happens at each step. So here's the original expression. Python will call the len function and pass it hello, which returns the integer value 5, since it has 5 characters in it. Then in order to do string concatenation, we have to turn this integer value 5 into a string value, so we pass it to the string function, which then returns the value 5 as a string, and then we just do string concatenation. So function calls can be part of expressions because they evaluate to a value returned by the function call. When creating a function using the def statement, you can specify what return value should be with a return statement. In the file editor, let's write the following code. We'll define a function called plus one. It has, a, it has a parameter called number. And then we have a return statement where it returns number plus one. The value that this expression evaluates to will be the return value of this function. We can call this function and say pass it the integer value 5. 5 gets assigned a number, and this will return 5 plus 1. So this function call evaluates the integer 6. Let's save that in a variable called new number. And then we can just pass that new number variable to print. So when we run this program, it displays 6. You might be wondering, since all function calls return values, what does the print function return? If you type the string hello into the interactive shell, this evaluates to itself, hello. But when you call print and pass it the string hello, the quotes for the string aren't there. This is because print doesn't return the string, it just displays the string as a side effect. It actually returns a special value called none. 
that's typed none with a capital N and no quotes, kind of like the true and false Boolean values. The none value is the only value of the none type data type. It's a value that represents a lack of a value, and this comes in handy in a lot of different programs. The thing is, in the interactive shell, none doesn't show up if you enter it. It's not like a string value or an integer value which gets displayed. The interactive shell is specifically programmed not to bother printing, uh, printing this out. And that's because whenever we have a call to print like this, we want it to print that string out, but we also don't, in this case, don't want it to show that none return value that print returns, which is why nothing shows up here. But print does return the none value as its return value. You could have some code like spam equals print, and spam, nothing shows up because the none value is in spam. We could have something like spam equals equals none, which is an expression that evaluates to true. What you should take away from this is that every function call has a return value, even the print function. But you don't have to have a return statement in all of your functions. If your function doesn't have a return statement, the return value defaults to the none value. Some functions have a kind of argument called keyword arguments. These are often used for optional arguments to pass to a function call. For example, the print function usually adds a new line to the end of the string it prints. In a file editor, Let's just enter this code. Print hello, print world, and press F5 to run that. These two strings appear on separate lines because the print function automatically adds a new line character to the end of the string it's passed. So that causes a new line to start after hello is print and a new line to start after world is print. However, you can set the end keyword argument to change this to a different string besides the new line character. We can do that by doing this. Add a comma to pass in a new argument. It's the keyword argument end, which is equal to the value, uh, the string value blank, the blank string, which causes, since there's no new line after hello, world ends up on the same line as the previous print call. Similarly, when you pass multiple string values to print, the function will the print function will automatically separate them with a single space character. So I can pass multiple arguments to print like cat, dog, mouse, and it automatically adds a single space character in between them. However, if I pass the sep keyword argument, this will this will allow, allow me to change what the separating character is. And I could say, make this ABC instead of a single space. And now the string ABC appears in between each of the arguments that it prints out. These keyword arguments are optional. Most of the time you don't need them, but the end and sep keyword arguments make the print function display exactly what you want it to. To recap, functions are like a mini program inside your program. The main point of functions is to get rid of duplicate code. The def statement defines a function. The input to functions are arguments. The output is the return value. The parameters are variables in between the function's parentheses in the def statement. The arguments are assigned to these parameters. The return value is specified using the return statement. Every function has a return value. If your function doesn't have a return statement, the default return value is the none value. And keyword arguments to functions are usually for optional arguments. The print function has keyword arguments end and sep. Welcome to lesson 9, which roughly covers pages 61 to 66 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. There's three parts to this lesson. Functions, the none value, and keyword arguments. You're already familiar with the print, input, and len functions from the previous lessons. Python provides several built-in functions like these, but you can also write your own functions. A function is like a mini program within a program. It contains code that executes when the function is called, just like your program contains code that executes when the program is run. Let's look at an example by opening a new file editor window. I'll type def hello to define this new function called hello, and the code inside of it will be 
print howdy, print howdy, print hello there. And then I'll call this function three times. Save it as example and press F5 to run it. This code uses a def statement to define a new function called hello. The code in the block that follows the def statement is the body of the function. Whenever we call the hello function, the execution moves to the top of this function and executes the code inside of it. I'm going to copy and paste this code into the visualization tool at pythontutor.com so we can see what this does better. Visualize execution. You can see that the def statement only defines a function. It doesn't execute the code inside of it. The execution skips its block when the function is first defined. The code inside the function only runs when the function is called. At that point, the execution moves inside of the function and then moves down as normal. At the very end, the execution returns to the function call and then proceeds down to the next line. Here we call it again, so the execution moves into the hello function again. And then we call it a third time and the execution moves into the hello function again. The main purpose of functions is to group code that gets executed multiple times. Without a function defined, you would have to copy and paste this code each time, and the program would look like this. Copy and paste, and copy and paste, and copy and paste. In general, you always want to avoid duplicating code, because if you ever decide to update the code, if, for example, you find a bug that you need to fix, you'll have to remember to change the code everywhere you copied it. As you get more programming experience, you'll often find yourself deduplicating code, which means to get rid of duplicated or copied and pasted code. Deduplication makes your program shorter, easier to read, and easier to update. When you call the print or len function, you pass in values called arguments. These arguments go in between the parentheses. So let's change the code in the Python tutor tool and type in the following to add arguments to our code. We'll add name here in between the parentheses, and then add the code print hello plus name. And then we'll call it twice. The first time we'll pass the string Alice, and the second time we'll pass the string Bob. So in between the def statements parentheses is the name variable, which in this context is called a parameter. When the function is called, the name parameter is assigned the argument that is passed. So we'll define the function, and then we call the hello function, passing the Alice string as the argument. This argument gets assigned to the name parameter, and then we just execute the code inside the function. On the second call to the hello function, we pass the string bob as the argument. The argument gets assigned to the name parameter, and then we execute it as normal. Just to get the terminology straight, the strings Alice and Bob, these values, are called arguments, while the variable here is called a parameter. When you call the len function and pass it an argument such as the string hello, the function call evaluates to the integer value 5, which is the length of the string you passed it. Function calls can be part of expressions because they evaluate to the value returned by the function call. Let's try the expression hello has plus call the string function, call the len function, and pass it hello plus letters in it. This expression evaluates down to this string. It has these two function calls in it. We'll use this expression of 
uh, demonstration tool to show you what happens at each step. So here's the original expression. Python will call the len function and pass it hello, which returns the integer value 5, since it has 5 characters in it. Then in order to do string concatenation, we have to turn this integer value 5 into a string value, so we pass it to the string function, which then returns the value 5 as a string, and then we just do string concatenation. So function calls can be part of expressions because they evaluate to a value returned by the function call. When creating a function using the def statement, you can specify what return value should be with a return statement. In the file editor, let's write the following code. We'll define a function called plus one. It has a, it has a parameter called number. And then we have a return statement where it returns number plus one. The value that this expression evaluates to will be the return value of this function. We can call this function and say pass it the integer value 5. 5 gets assigned a number and this will return 5 plus 1. So this function call evaluates the integer 6. Let's save that in a variable called new number. And then we can just pass that new number variable to print. So when we run this program, it displays 6. You might be wondering, since all function calls return values, what does the print function return? If you type the string hello into the interactive shell, this evaluates to itself, hello. But when you call print and pass it the string hello, the quotes for the string aren't there. This is because print doesn't return the string, it just displays the string as a side effect. It actually returns a special value called none. That's typed none with a capital N and no quotes, kind of like the true and false boolean values. The none value is the only value of the none type data type. It's a value that represents a lack of a value, and this comes in handy in a lot of different programs. The thing is, in the interactive shell, none doesn't show up if you enter it. It's not like a string value or an integer value which gets displayed. The interactive shell is specifically programmed not to bother printing, uh, printing this out, and that's because whenever we have a call to print like this, we want it to print that string out but we also don't, in this case, don't want it to show that none return value that print returns, which is why nothing shows up here. But print does return the none value as its return value. You could have some code like spam equals print, and spam, nothing shows up because the none value is in spam. We could have something like spam equals equals none, which is an expression that evaluates to true. What you should take away from this is that every function call has a return value, even the print function. But you don't have to have a return statement in all of your functions. If your function doesn't have a return statement, the return value defaults to the none value. Some functions have a kind of argument called keyword arguments. These are often used for optional arguments to pass to a function call. For example, the print function usually adds a new line to the end of the string it prints. In a file editor, Let's just enter this code. Print hello, print world, and press F5 to run that. These two strings appear on separate lines because the print function automatically adds a new line character to the end of the string it's passed. So that causes a new line to start after hello is print and a new line to start after world is print. However, you can set the end keyword argument to change this to a different string besides the new line character. We can do that by doing this. Add a comma to pass in a new argument. It's the keyword argument end, which is equal to the value, uh, the string value blank, the blank string, which causes, since there's no new line after hello, world ends up on the same line as the previous print call. Similarly, when you pass multiple string values to print, 
the function will the print function will automatically separate them with a single space character. So I can pass multiple arguments to print like cat, dog, mouse, and it automatically adds a single space character in between them. However, if I pass the sep keyword argument, this will this will allow, allow me to change what the separating character is, and I could say make this ABC instead of a single space, and now the string ABC appears in between each of the arguments that it prints out. These keyword arguments are optional. Most of the time you don't need them, but the end and sep keyword arguments make the print function display exactly what you want it to. To recap, functions are like a mini program inside your program. The main point of functions is to get rid of duplicate code. The def statement defines a function. The input to functions are arguments. The output is the return value. The parameters are variables in between the function's parentheses in the def statement. The arguments are assigned to these parameters. The return value is specified using the return statement. Every function has a return value. If your function doesn't have a return statement, the default return value is the none value. And keyword arguments to functions are usually for optional arguments. The print function has keyword arguments end and sep. Welcome to lesson 10, which roughly covers pages 67 to 71 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In Python, variables inside of a function can have the same name as a variable outside of the function, but they're considered two separate variables. To understand how this works, you need to know about global and local scopes. Parameters and variables that are assigned in a function are said to exist in that function's local scope. Variables that are assigned outside of all functions are said to exist in the global scope. So a scope covers an area of the source code. Any given line in your program is in the global scope or a local scope. Each function has its own local scope. So in this program, this and this is the global scope, whereas this is a function's local scope, the eggs function's local scope. You can also think of a scope as a container of variables. A variable that exists in a local scope is called a local variable, while a variable that exists in the global scope is called a global variable. All variables are either one or the other. That is, a variable can't be both local and global. So scope is a container of variables. The global scope is created when the program starts and is destroyed when the program terminates. A local scope is created whenever a function is called and all the variables assigned during this function call exist within that local scope. When the function returns, the local scope is destroyed and these variables are forgotten. Because the variables in a function's local scope are forgotten, you should think of variables inside of a function as being temporary. They won't exist after the function returns. In this example, this spam is a global variable because it's assigned outside of all functions in the global scope, while this spam is a local variable since it's assigned inside of a function. And scopes matter for several reasons. One, code in a global scope can't use local variables. Two, however, code in a local scope can access global variables. Three, code in one function's local scope cannot use variables in another function's local scope. And four, you can use the same name for different variables if they're in different scopes. So let's go over each of those four points individually. They make sense as long as you keep in mind that a global scope for global variables is created when the program starts and is destroyed when the program ends, and a local scope for local variables is created when the function is called and destroyed when the function re returns. Local variables cannot be used in the global scope. I'm going to use the online Python tutor at pythontutor.com to demonstrate this. Consider this program, which will cause an error when you run it. This seems like it should work. First, spam is defined, then we call spam, that assigns eggs the value 99, then we try to print out the value eggs, but this actually causes an error. So let's view it step by step. The spam function gets defined, we skip over the code inside of it because we're just defining the function, we're not calling it. On line four, we call the spam function, so the execution moves inside of the spam statement. 
And now that we've called the spam function, we've created a local scope for spam. Any variables assigned inside this function will exist inside this local scope. So eggs equals 99, that's creating a local variable eggs, and we're assigning it 99. Then the spam function returns, which means its local scope is destroyed and any variables in that scope are forgotten. So when we return from the spam function, that eggs variable no longer exists. So when we try to print eggs, Python says, hey, there's no variable named eggs defined in this program. So local variables can't be used in the global scope. Local scopes can't use variables in other functions' local scopes. So consider this program. We'll have the same, but we'll also call bacon and then print eggs. We'll define that bacon function where it assigns a variable ham to one, uh, 101 and then also assigns eggs to be zero. So let's run this program and see what happens. So first step, spam is defined. We skip over the body of that function. And then bacon is defined, and we skip over the body of that function. And now our program calls the spam function. So this is a function call. So a local, ver local scope gets created for the spam function. Inside this local scope, eggs is assigned 99. So we have a local variable eggs inside this spam scope. And now we call the bacon function from spam. So the execution moves into bacon. We create a new local scope for the bacon function. So now there are two local scopes that exist, one for spam, one for bacon. Inside bacon's local scope, we assign the variable ham, a local variable in bacon, the value 101. And then we assign the, uh, the variable eggs zero. Notice this is a separate variable this eggs isn't the same as this eggs. They have the same name, but they're referring to two different variables. This one exists in bacon's local scope, and this one exists in spam's local scope. Now we've reached the end of the bacon function here, so we're going to return, which means that bacon's local scope is destroyed, so that ham and eggs variable are now gone. So inside the spam function, we're going to print eggs, and by that, it means print out spam's eggs variable. So the eggs variable here is gone, which is why it prints out 99 and not zero for this print function call, because local scopes can't use variables in other local scopes. This eggs can only refer to an eggs variable inside this function. It doesn't refer to an eggs variable inside of another function. The upshot of this is that local variables in one function are completely separate from the local variables in another function. If you see eggs right here, you know you're talking about eggs in this function and not in some other function. Global variables can be read from a local scope. So consider this function. We'll just have a spam function that runs print eggs. We'll get rid of this bacon function. Let's have eggs equals 42. So this is assigned outside of all functions in the global scope. So this is a global eggs variable. And then we'll call spam, which then prints eggs. So when we run this, we can see first we define that spam function. And we, then we assign in a global eggs variable, the value 42, and then we call spam. So we've called a function. So a local scope gets created for it. And here, we're going to run print eggs. Now, since there's no local variable named eggs, Python is smart enough to say, hey, uh, maybe they're talking about a global variable named eggs. Since there's no eggs local variable, it'll check to see if there's an eggs global variable instead, which it finds it, and so it then prints out that one. So this prints out 42. One thing you might ask here is, if you see a variable inside of a function, is it a local variable, or is it a global variable that's just being read from the local scope? The way Python distinguishes between these two possibilities is that if there's an assignment statement for a variable anywhere in that function, it's considered a local variable. Only if there isn't an assignment statement, like in our example program, Python checks if there's a global variable by that name. 
this eggs is global, but add an assignment statement, eggs equals hello, and now Python will treat it as a local variable. Let's go ahead and run this program, and you can see the difference between these two separate variables. Spam gets defined, a global eggs variable gets assigned 42, and we call spam, which creates a local scope for spam, and now we assign eggs the string value hello. This is a local eggs, which is separate from the global eggs variable. And then we print out the value of eggs, which prints out hello, the value inside the local eggs variable. Then we return, that local scope gets destroyed, and then we run this exact same code, print eggs, that was here, except this time we're in the global scope, it's referring to the global eggs variable, so that prints out 42. But what if you want to assign a new value to a global variable from inside of a function? Say I wanted to change the global eggs variable to be the string hello, but as soon as I add the assignment statement to do this, Python thinks it's a separate local variable. To mark eggs as a global variable, you have to add a global statement to the top of the function global eggs. This tells Python, even though I have an assignment statement for eggs inside this function, eggs in this function will always refer to the global eggs variable. Don't create a separate local variable. That's it for global and local scope. You might want to watch this video again just to get these concepts straight in your mind, but first you might wonder, why do we even have scopes at all? Wouldn't it be simpler if everything was a global variable? The benefit that local scopes provide is that they separate a function's code from the rest of the program. If something is going wrong because a variable has some bad value, there's only a limited area of the program you have to check for this bug. If something is going wrong in the global scope because of a bad variable value, you only have to check the code in the global scope. And if something is going wrong inside of a function because of a bad variable, you only have to check the code inside the function. The code in the global scope or a different function's local scope can't directly affect that function's local variables. Local scopes let you treat functions as black boxes. All that matters is the arguments you pass into the function when you call it and the return value that the function call returns. As long as the function's code is working, the rest of your program doesn't have to worry about its code and variables. To recap, a scope can be thought of as an area of the source code and also as a container of variables. The global scope is code outside of all functions. Variables assigned here are global variables. Each function's code is in its own local scope. Variables assigned here are local variables to that function. Code in the global scope can't use local variables. And code in a function's local scope can't use variables in another function's local scope. If there's an assignment statement for a variable in a function, that is a local variable, unless that variable has been marked global with a global statement. And the point of scopes is to isolate code so that the cause of bugs is limited to a particular area of the program. Welcome to Lesson 10, which roughly covers pages 67 to 71 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In Python, variables inside of a function can have the same name as a variable outside of the function, but they're considered two separate variables. To understand how this works, you need to know about global and local scopes. Parameters and variables that are assigned in a function are said to exist in that function's local scope. Variables that are assigned outside of all functions are said to exist in the global scope. So a scope covers an area of the source code. Any given line in your program is in the global scope or a local scope. Each function has its own local scope. So in this program, this and this is the global scope, whereas this is a function's local scope, the eggs function's local scope. You can also think of a scope as a container of variables. A variable that exists in a local scope is called a local variable, while a variable that exists in the global scope is called a global variable. All variables are either one or the other. That is, a variable can't be both local and global. So scope is a container of variables. The global scope is created when the program starts and is destroyed when the program terminates. A local scope is created whenever a function is called and all the variables assigned during this function call exist within that local scope. When the function returns, the local scope is destroyed and these variables are forgotten. 
Because the variables in a function's local scope are forgotten, you should think of variables inside of a function as being temporary. They won't exist after the function returns. In this example, this spam is a global variable because it's assigned outside of all functions in the global scope, while this spam is a local variable since it's assigned inside of a function. And scopes matter for several reasons. One, code in a global scope can't use local variables. Two, however, code in a local scope can access global variables. Three, code in one function's local scope cannot use variables in another function's local scope. And four, you can use the same name for different variables if they're in different scopes. So let's go over each of those four points individually. They make sense as long as you keep in mind that a global scope for global variables is created when the program starts and is destroyed when the program ends, and a local scope for local variables is created when the function is called and destroyed when the function re returns. Local variables cannot be used in the global scope. I'm going to use the online Python tutor at pythontutor.com to demonstrate this. Consider this program, which will cause an error when you run it. This seems like it should work. First, spam is defined, then we call spam, that assigns eggs the value 99, then we try to print out the value eggs, but this actually causes an error. So let's view it step by step. The spam function gets defined, we skip over the code inside of it because we're just defining the function, we're not calling it. On line four, we call the spam function, so the execution moves inside of the spam statement. And now that we've called the spam function, We've created a local scope for spam. Any variables assigned inside this function will exist inside this local scope. So eggs equals 99, that's creating a local variable eggs, and we're assigning it 99. Then the spam function returns, which means its local scope is destroyed and any variables in that scope are forgotten. So when we return from the spam function, that eggs variable no longer exists. So when we try to print eggs, Python says, hey, there's no variable named eggs defined in this program. So local variables can't be used in the global scope. Local scopes can't use variables in other functions' local scopes. So consider this program. We'll have the same, but we'll also call bacon and then print eggs. We'll define that bacon function where it assigns a variable ham to one, uh, 101, and then also assigns eggs to be zero. So let's run this program and see what happens. So first step, spam is defined, we skip over the body of that function, and then bacon is defined, and we skip over the body of that function. And now our program calls the spam function. So this is a function call, so a local ver local scope gets created for the spam function. Inside this local scope, eggs is assigned 99, so we have a local variable eggs inside this spam scope. And now we call the bacon function from spam. So the execution moves into bacon. We create a new local scope for the bacon function. So now there are two local scopes that exist, one for spam, one for bacon. Inside bacon's local scope, we assign the variable ham, a local variable in bacon, the value 101, and then we assign the, uh, the variable eggs zero. Notice this is a separate variable. This eggs isn't the same as this eggs. They have the same name, but they're referring to two different variables. This one exists in bacon's local scope, and this one exists in spam's local scope. Now we've reached the end of the bacon function here, so we're going to return which means that bacon's local scope is destroyed, so that ham and eggs variable are now gone. So inside the spam function, we're going to print eggs, and by that it means print out spam's eggs variable. So the eggs variable here is gone, which is why it prints out 99 and not 0 for this print function call, because local scopes can't use variables in other local scopes. This eggs can only refer to an eggs variable inside this function. It doesn't refer to an eggs variable inside of another function.
The upshot of this is that local variables in one function are completely separate from the local variables in another function. If you see eggs right here, you know you're talking about eggs in this function and not in some other function. Global variables can be read from a local scope. So consider this function. We'll just have a spam function that runs print eggs. We'll get rid of this bacon function. Let's have eggs equals 42. So this is assigned outside of all functions in the global scope. So this is a global eggs variable. And then we'll call spam, which then prints eggs. So when we run this, we can see first we define that spam function. And we then we assign in a global eggs variable, the value 42, and then we call spam. So we've called a function. So a local scope gets created for it. And here, we're going to run print eggs. Now, since there's no local variable named eggs, Python is smart enough to say, hey, uh, maybe they're talking about a global variable named eggs. Since there's no eggs local variable, it'll check to see if there's an eggs global variable instead, which it finds it, and so it then prints out that one. So this prints out 42. One thing you might ask here is, if you see a variable inside of a function, is it a local variable, or is it a global variable that's just being read from the local scope? The way Python distinguishes between these two possibilities is that if there's an assignment statement for a variable anywhere in that function, it's considered a local variable. Only if there isn't an assignment statement, like in our example program, Python checks if there's a global variable by that name. This eggs is global, but add an assignment statement eggs equals hello, and now Python will treat it as a local variable. Let's go ahead and run this program, and you can see the difference between these two separate variables. Spam gets defined, a global eggs variable gets assigned 42, and we call spam, which creates a local scope for spam, and now we assign eggs the string value hello. This is a local eggs, which is separate from the global eggs variable, and then we print out the value of eggs, which prints out hello, the value inside the local eggs variable. Then we return, that local scope gets destroyed, and then we run this exact same code, print eggs, that was here, except this time we're in the global scope, it's referring to the global eggs variable, so that prints out 42. But what if you want to assign a new value to a global variable from inside of a function? Say I wanted to change the global eggs variable to be the string hello. But as soon as I add the assignment statement to do this, Python thinks it's a separate local variable. To mark eggs as a global variable, you have to add a global statement to the top of the function. Global eggs. This tells Python, even though I have an assignment statement for eggs inside this function, eggs in this function will always refer to the global eggs variable. Don't create a separate local variable. That's it for global and local scope. You might want to watch this video again just to get these concepts straight in your mind, but first you might wonder, why do we even have scopes at all? Wouldn't it be simpler if everything was a global variable? And the benefit that local scopes provide is that they separate a function's code from the rest of the program. If something is going wrong because a variable has some bad value, there's only a limited area of the program you have to check for this bug. If something is going wrong in the global scope because of a bad variable value, you only have to check the code in the global scope. And if something is going wrong inside of a function because of a bad variable, you only have to check the code inside the function. The code in the global scope or a different function's local scope can't directly affect that function's local variables. Local scopes let you treat functions as black boxes. All that matters is the arguments you pass into the function when you call it and the return value that the function call returns. As long as the function's code is working, the rest of your program doesn't have to worry about its code and variables. To recap, a scope can be thought of as an area of the source code and also as a container of variables. The global scope is code outside of all functions. Variables assigned here are global variables. Each function's code is in its own local scope. Variables assigned here are local variables to that function. Code in the global scope can't use local variables, and code in a function's local scope 
can't use variables in another function's local scope. If there's an assignment statement for a variable in a function, that is a local variable, unless that variable has been marked global with a global statement. And the point of scopes is to isolate code so that the cause of bugs is limited to a particular area of the program. Welcome to Lesson 11, which roughly covers pages 72 and 73 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Right now, getting an error or exception in your Python program means that the entire program will crash. You don't want this to happen in real-world programs. Instead, you want the program to be able to detect errors, handle them, and then continue to run. We can make an error happen easily. So in a new file, enter the following. def div 42 by divide by. This will be a function that just returns the value 42 divided by whatever argument we passed in. We can call this here print div 42 by divided by 2 divided by 12 divided by 0 and divided by 1. And I'll just save this as example.py and I'll run this program. So we can see this has caused an error. This line worked just fine. It called div 42 by and it passed 2. So it returned 42 divided by 2, which was just 21. That got printed to the screen. Then we also called it by passing 12. So 42 divided by 12 returned 3.5. But then an error happened here when we passed in 0. 42 divided by 0 caused this zero division error. Computers don't really know how to handle dividing a number by a zero. So whenever that happens, it says, well, I don't want to continue running the instructions in this program because I've just come across this error that I don't know how to handle. So instead, it crashes and terminates the program. That's why this function call never gets made, because the program crashed at this point. But you can handle an error with a try and accept statement. Modify the program so that it looks like this. Try colon return 42 divided by divide by and accept zero division error. That's this error's name right here. Colon print error you tried to divide by zero. Now when we run this program, you can see it divides by two, it divides by 12, it tries to divide by zero, which causes this error to happen, and it runs this code. And since there's no return statement, this function just ends up returning the none value, which gets printed here. And then the program continues on. It calls div 42 by and passes 1 to it, so 42 divided by 1 is 42. And the program just ran to completion. It didn't have any sort of ugly error message that appeared. And this happens because when code in a try clause causes a zero division error, the program execution immediately moves to the code inside the accept clause. And after running that code, the, ex the execution continues running as normal. This keeps the program from crashing entirely. You can also have a simple accept statement without specifying the type of error it catches, and it will catch all types of errors. Now, this code can be useful for input validation. Say I have a program where I enter the number of cats I own. It might look like this. So here it asks, how many cats do you have? The user can type in how many they have. It's assigned to numcats. And since input returns a string value, 
we have to convert that to an integer, and then that's compared to see if it's greater than or equal to 4, and if so, it prints out, that's a lot of cats, otherwise it prints out, that's not that many cats. So let's run this program. How many cats do you have? I'll just enter 5, it says, that is a lot of cats. Let's run that again. How many cats do you have? Uh, zero. That is not that many cats. There's a possible problem with this code, though. The user can type in anything. They don't have to type in a number. So when I run this program, I could type in 6, and then that causes an error. This error happens because the string 6 assigned to the variable numCats is then passed to the int function, which is expecting a string that has numeric digits in it. Int works just fine if you have a string like 6, but as soon as you try to pass it a string that doesn't have numeric digits in it, like the word 6, then it causes a value error. So we can add a try accept block inside here. to handle this error. Accept value error. Print, you did not enter a number. Now when I run this program, I can type anything I want, and it'll give me an error message saying, you did not enter a number, but that's a lot better looking than just this ugly looking Python error message. And this is what we mean by input validation. It validates the input that the user has given us so that it doesn't cause the program to crash. Just for extra credit, you might want to change this program because technically a user could enter something like negative four cats, which is technically not greater than or equal to four, so it prints out that it's not that many cats. See if you can figure out some code to add to this program that would change it so that it detects when the user enters a negative number and displays a different error message. To recap, a divide by zero error happens whenever the pro a Python program tries to divide a number by zero. Errors usually cause the program to crash entirely because Python doesn't know how to continue on after that. It doesn't want to run the, the instructions with bad data, so it just halts the entire program and displays this error message. But an error that happens inside a try block will cause code in the accept block to execute. That code can handle the error or display a message to the user or whatever you want it to do so that the program can keep going. Welcome to lesson 11, which roughly covers pages 72 and 73 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Right now, getting an error or exception in your Python program means that the entire program will crash. You don't want this to happen in real-world programs. Instead, you want the program to be able to detect errors, handle them, and then continue to run. We can make an error happen easily. So in a new file, enter the following. def div 42 by divide by. This will be a function that just returns the value 42 divided by whatever argument we passed in. We can call this here, print div 42 by divided by 2, divided by 12, divided by 0, and divided by 1. And I'll just save this as example.py, and I'll run this program. So we can see, this has caused an error. This line worked just fine. It called div 42 by, and it passed 2. So it returned 42 divided by 2, which was just 21. That got printed to the screen. Then we also called it by passing 12. So 42 divided by 12 returned 3.5. But then an error happened here when we passed in 0. 42 divided by 0 caused this zero division error. Computers don't really know how to handle dividing a number by a zero. So whenever that happens, it says, well, I don't want to continue running the instructions in this program because I've just come across this error that I don't know how to handle. So instead, it crashes and terminates the program. That's why this function call never gets made, because the program crashed at this point.
but you can handle an error with a try and accept statement. Modify the program so that it looks like this. Try colon return 42 divided by divide by and accept zero division error. That's this error's name right here. Colon print error you tried to divide by zero. Now when we run this program, you can see it divides by two, it divides by 12, it tries to divide by zero, which causes this error to happen, and it runs this code. And since there's no return statement, this function just ends up returning the none value, which gets printed here. And then the program continues on. It calls div 42 by and passes one to it. So 42 divided by one is 42. And the program just ran to completion. It didn't have any sort of ugly error message that appeared. And this happens because when code in a try clause causes a zero division error, the program execution immediately moves to the code inside the accept clause. And after running that code, the, ex the execution continues running as normal. This keeps the program from crashing entirely. You can also have a simple accept statement without specifying the type of error it catches, and it will catch all types of errors. Now, this code can be useful for input validation. Say I have a program where I enter the number of cats I own. It might look like this. So here it asks, how many cats do you have? The user can type in how many they have. It's assigned to numcats. And since input returns a string value, we have to convert that to an integer. And then that's compared to see if it's greater than or equal to four. And if so, it prints out, that's a lot of cats. Otherwise it prints out, that's not that many cats. So let's run this program. How many cats do you have? I'll just enter five. It says that is a lot of cats. Let's run that again. How many cats do you have? Uh, zero. That is not that many cats. There's a possible problem with this code though. The user can type in anything. They don't have to type in a number. So when I run this program, I could type in six. And then that causes an error. This error happens because the string six assigned to the variable num cats is then passed to the int function, which is expecting a string that has numeric digits in it. Int works just fine if you have a string like 6, but as soon as you try to pass it a string that doesn't have numeric digits in it, like the word 6, then it causes a value error. So we can add a try accept block inside here. To handle this error. Accept value error. print, you did not enter a number. Now when I run this program, I can type anything I want, and it'll give me an error message saying you did not enter a number, but that's a lot better looking than just this ugly looking Python error message. And this is what we mean by input validation. It validates the input that the user has given us so that it doesn't cause the program to crash. Just for extra credit, you might want to change this program because technically a user could enter something like negative four cats, which is technically not greater than or equal to four, so it prints out that it's not that many cats. See if you can figure out some code to add to this program that would change it so that it detects when the user enters a negative number and displays a different error message. To recap, a divide by zero error happens whenever the pro a Python program tries to divide a number by zero. Errors usually cause the program to crash entirely because 
Python doesn't know how to continue on after that. It doesn't want to run the, the instructions with bad data, so it just halts the entire program and displays this error message. But an error that happens inside a try block will cause code in the accept block to execute. That code can handle the error or display a message to the user or whatever you want it to do so that the program can keep going. Welcome to lesson 12, which covers pages 74 to 76 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python book. Thanks for making it this far. You've learned a lot of programming concepts, and you might be thinking, eh, this is interesting and all, but when are we going to actually start writing programs? In this lesson, we're going to use our programming knowledge to make something fun. We'll create a guess the number game that looks like this. Here's the complete program. I'm just going to press F5 to run this, and it prints out, hello, what is your name? I'll type in Al. Well, Al, I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 20. Take a guess. I'll just try 10. Now oh, that guess is too high, so take a guess. How about 5? Now oh, that's too low. How about 8? Now oh, that's too high. 7? Now oh, that's too high, so I guess it must be 6. And then it says, good job, Al. You guessed my number in 5 guesses. In this game, you'll only get about 6 guesses to get the number correct, so if I keep guessing incorrectly, say 10, 10, 10. It'll eventually say, nope, the number I was thinking of was 6, or whatever random number it was thinking of. So you may not realize it, but you already know everything you need to make this game. But it can be hard to figure out how to put all these concepts together, so we'll go through step by step how to make a complete program. First, let's think about what we want this program to do. At the start, it says, hello, what's your name, and it lets you type in your name. Then it tells you that it's thinking of a random number between 1 and 20, and then it seems to enter this loop where it constantly asks you to take a guess, and then tells you if your guess is too high or too low, and then asks you, and then it loops back and asks you to take another guess until you've actually guessed it correctly, at which point it'll say, good job, Al, you've guessed the number in however many guesses it took. So it's going to keep track of how many guesses you've taken. Or, if you've taken too many guesses, it'll just give up and go ahead and tell you what number it was thinking of. Keeping all that in mind, we'll just do it step by step. First I'm going to start it off with a comment just to describe what this program is. Oh, this is a guess the number game. And let's see, so we have to come up with a random number, so that means we're going to need the random module, so let's import the random module. We'll use that for the uh, randint function that'll come up with a random number. Let's see, at the very start of the game, oh yeah, ask for your name, so print hello, what is your name? We'll have to call the input function to let the user type in their name, and I guess we'll want to store that in a variable since we'll use it later, so we can say name equals input. The name variable stores whatever string they typed in, and then we can greet that player by saying print well uh, whatever your name is. So use string concatenation to create that string. I am thinking of a number between 1 and 20. Let's actually generate that number. We'll call it secret number, and we'll call the random module's rant int function and pass it 1 and 20 to tell it to give us a, an integer, a random integer between 1 and 20, including 1 and including 20. So that'll get stored in a variable called secret number. So now we want to enter that loop uh, where it asks the player to guess up to six times or guess a number, and then it tells us if that guess is too low or too high. Since we wanted to specifically loop a, a certain number of times, let's use a for loop. So we can say for, and then a, var a variable for this. Let's say guess is taken in range, and we could have in range six, but let's actually have this, instead of starting at zero and going up to but not including six, let's have it start at one and go up to but not including 7. We're using that two argument form of the range, range function. The benefit of using a for loop like this is, well, we have whatever code here, but then afterwards we can always say something like print you took guesses taken. 
guesses. Or something like that. Get the variable guesses taken will have an accurate number of the number of guesses that the player took. I'm just going to push this code down there for now. Let's add the code that goes inside this loop. First, we ask the player to take a guess. And we need to get some input from the player, so we'll have to call the input function and store this in a variable. We'll just say the player's guess is stored in a variable named guess. But the user will be typing in some number, and input returns a string, so we're going to want to convert that to int by passing it to the integer function. That's because we're going to have something like, you know, if their guess is less than the secret number, in order for this code to work properly, both of these have to be integers. And so secret number is an integer because this function returns integers. And in order to properly compare this, we have to make guess also an integer. So that's why we pass whatever this input returns to int, and then this will evaluate to an integer version of whatever they typed in. So if guess is less than the secret number, we have to tell them, your guess is too low. Else if the guess is larger than the secret number, we'll tell them, your guess is too high. And then we can have an else clause right here, because the only other possibility is that guess is directly equal to the secret number. If they correctly guessed it, we'll want to just break out of this loop and then proceed on to the rest of the program. And that's the entire loop. If they've guessed too low, it just prints this and then moves past this if elif else statements and it reaches the end of the loop so it goes back to the start and asks them to take another guess. Same thing if they, if they guess too high. So when this loop ends, it'll either be because they've gone through all six iterations of the loop and it broke out naturally, or because this break statement caused the execution to break out of the loop prematurely. We can tell which one it is because if it was broken out, if it broke out of the loop prematurely, that'll be because the value in guess is the same as the value in secret number. It's because they guessed it correctly. Let's add a little comment here to remind us of this. So we're either going to show them the good job, you guessed it in however many guesses, or the nope, the secret number was actually whatever it was. We'll show one of those two messages depending on if guess is still equal to the secret number or not. So we could say something like if guess equals equals secret number, print out, good job. Uh, whatever your name is. You guess my number in guesses taken. Guesses. So we tell them how many guesses that took. Of course, this is an integer value, remember, so in order to do string concatenation, we're first going to have to convert it to a string pass the value inside guesses taken to the string function, which then returns a string value version of guesses taken, and then we can use that to concatenate it to all of these other strings. However, if guess is less than or greater than secret number, which would be the case if this loop broke out naturally, and if guess is not equal to the secret number, we'll display a message like, nope. The number I was thinking of was, and then we'll display the secret number. Remember, of course, secret number is an integer, so we'll need a string instead. So call the string function. And then we'll just get rid of this line. Let's test this out. I'll just press F5 to run it. Hello, what is your name? My name is Well, blah blah blah. I am thinking of a number between 1 and 20. Take a guess. So I can say 10. That's too low. 
So how about 15? That's too low. 18, too high. 16, too low. 17. Good job. You guessed my number in five guesses. Is that right? Yeah. Here's one, two, three, four, five guesses. That's great. Okay, but we want to make sure that this entire program works. Let's purposefully lose just to make sure that this game handles that case appropriately. So take a guess. Uh, one, 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 one. And then after this sixth guess, it should naturally proceed on with the rest of the program. And it says, nope, the number I was thinking of was 20. And that's because here, guess was the last guess I added, which was 1, and that's not equal to the secret number, which was 20. So that's why the else clause executes. So that's it. That's a pretty simple game. If you ever just need to test it out, you can also temporarily add some code just to help you make sure it's working correctly. So I could add code that says, say, print debug. Secret number is, and then just tell me what the secret number is. And I can take this code out later, but for right now, it'll be good just so that I can say, oh, okay, the secret number is 17. So if I guess 17, that should work. Or in this case, the secret number is now 19. So if I enter 20, it should say that guess is too high. Oh, that's right. And if I enter 18, it should say that guess is too low. Oh, okay. And then once you're done and you want to show this program off to your friends, you can just remove that code. But that's it. That's all of these concepts are things that we've gone over in the previous lessons. Importing functions, print and input, assignment statements, uh, doing for loops, converting to integers or to strings, and then also if, elif, and else, and break, st break statements. All of this is just taking all of these concepts that we've learned and just mixing them all together, kind of like following a recipe and cooking up a meal from ingredients. Welcome to lesson 12, which covers pages 74 to 76 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python book. Thanks for making it this far. You've learned a lot of programming concepts, and you might be thinking, eh, this is interesting and all, but when are we going to actually start writing programs? In this lesson, we're going to use our programming knowledge to make something fun. We'll create a guess the number game that looks like this. Here's the complete program. I'm just going to press F5 to run this, and it prints out, hello, what is your name? I'll type in Al. Well, Al, I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 20. Take a guess. I'll just try 10. Now oh, that guess is too high, so take a guess. How about 5? Now oh, that's too low. How about 8? Now oh, that's too high. 7? Now oh, that's too high, so I guess it must be 6. And then it says, good job, Al. You guessed my number in 5 guesses. In this game, you'll only get about 6 guesses to get the number correct. So if I keep guessing incorrectly, say 10, 10, 10, it'll eventually say, nope the number I was thinking of was 6, or whatever random number it was thinking of. So you may not realize it, but you already know everything you need to make this game. But it can be hard to figure out how to put all these concepts together, so we'll go through step by step how to make a complete program. First let's think about what we want this program to do. At the start it says, hello, what's your name, and it lets you type in your name. Then it tells you that it's thinking of a random number between 1 and 20, and then it seems to enter this loop where it constantly asks you to take a guess and then tells you if your guess is too high or too low and then asks you and then it loops back and asks you to take another guess until you've actually guessed it correctly at what point it'll say good job Al you've guessed the number in however many guesses it took so it's going to keep track of how many guesses you've taken or if you've taken too many guesses it'll just give up and go ahead and tell you what number it was thinking of Keeping all that in mind, we'll just do it step by step. First, I'm going to start it off with a comment just to describe what this program is. Oh, this is, I guess, the number game. And let's see, so we have to come up with a random number. So that means we're going to need the 
random module. So let's import the random module. We'll use that for the uh, rand int function that'll come up with a random number. Let's see, at the very start of the game, oh yeah, ask for your name. So print hello, what is your name? We'll have to call the input function to let the user type in their name, and I guess we'll want to store that in a variable since we'll use it later. So we can say name equals input. The name variable stores whatever string they typed in, and then we can greet that player by saying print well uh, whatever your name is. So use string concatenation to create that string. I am thinking of a number between 1 and 20. Let's actually generate that number. We'll call it secret number. And we'll call the random modules rant int function and pass it 1 and 20 to tell it to give us a, an integer, a random integer between 1 and 20, including 1 and including 20. So that'll get stored in a variable called secret number. So now we want to enter that loop uh, where it asks the player to guess up to six times or guess a number and then it tells us if that guess is too low or too high. Since we wanted to specifically loop a, a certain number of times, let's use a for loop. So we can say for and then a, ver a variable for this, let's say guess is taken in range and we could have in range six but let's actually have this instead of starting at zero and going up to but not including six let's have it start at one and go up to but not including seven we're using that two argument form of the range range function the benefit of using a for loop like this is well we have whatever code here but then afterwards we can always say something like print you took guesses taken guesses or something like that get the variable guesses taken will have an accurate number of the number of guesses that the player took I'm just going to push this code down there for now let's add the code that goes inside this loop first we ask the player to take a guess and we need to get some input from the player, so we'll have to call the input function and store this in a variable. We'll just say the player's guess is stored in a variable named guess. But the user will be typing in some number, and input returns a string, so we're going to want to convert that to int by passing it to the integer function. That's because we're going to have something like, you know, if their guess is less than the secret number, in order for this code to work properly, both of these have to be integers. And so secret number is an integer because this function returns integers. And in order to properly compare this, we have to make guess also an integer. So that's why we pass whatever this input returns to int, and then this will evaluate to an integer version of whatever they typed in. So if guess is less than the secret number, we have to tell them, your guess is too low. Else if the guess is larger than the secret number, we'll tell them, your guess is too high. And then we can have an else clause right here, because the only other possibility is that guess is directly equal to the secret number. If they correctly guessed it, we'll want to just break out of this loop and then proceed on to the rest of the program. And that's the entire loop. If they've guessed too low, it just prints this and then moves past this if l if else statements and it reaches the end of the loop so it goes back to the start and asks them to take another guess. Same thing if they uh, if they guess too high. So when this loop ends, it'll either be because they've gone through all six iterations of the loop and it broke out naturally, or because this break statement caused the execution to break out of the loop prematurely. We can tell which one it is because if it was broken out, if it broke out of the loop prematurely, that'll be because the value in guess is the same as the value in secret number. It's because they guessed it correctly. Let's add a little comment here to remind us of this. Yeah. 
So we're either going to show them the good job, you guessed it in however many guesses, or the nope, the secret number was actually whatever it was. We'll show one of those two messages depending on if guess is still equal to the secret number or not. So we could say something like if guess equals equals secret number, print out, good job, uh, whatever your name is. You guess my number in guesses taken, guesses. So we tell them how many guesses that took. Of course, this is an integer value, remember, so in order to do string concatenation, we're first going to have to convert it to a string. We pass the value inside guesses taken to the string function, which then returns a string value version of guesses taken, and then we can use that to concatenate it to all of these other strings. However, if guess is less than or greater than secret number, which would be the case if this loop broke out naturally, and if guess is not equal to the secret number, we'll display a message like, nope, the number I was thinking of was and then we'll display the secret number. Remember, of course, secret number is an integer, so we'll need a string instead. So call the string function. And then we'll just get rid of this line. Let's test this out. I'll just press F5 to run it. Hello, what is your name? My name is... Well, blah, 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 I am thinking of a number between 1 and 20. Take a guess. So I can say 10, that's too low. So how about 15, that's too low. 18, too high. 16, too low. 17, good job. You guessed my number in five guesses. Is that right? Yeah, here's one, two, three, four, five guesses. That's great. OK, but we want to make sure that this entire program works. Let's purposefully lose just to make sure that this game handles that case appropriately. So take a guess, uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And then after this sixth guess, it should naturally proceed on with the rest of the program. And it says, nope, the number I was thinking of was 20. And that's because here, guess was the last guess I added, which was 1, and that's not equal to the secret number, which was 20, so that's why the else clause executes. So that's it. That's a pretty simple game. If you ever just need to test it out, you can also temporarily add some code just to help you make sure it's working correctly. So I could add code that says, say, print debug secret number is, and then just tell me what the secret number is. And I can take this code out later, but for right now, it'll be good just so that I can say, oh, okay, the secret number is 17. So if I guess 17, that should work. Or in this case, the secret number is now 19. So if I enter 20, it should say that guess is too high. Oh, that's right. And if I enter 18, it should say that guess is too low. Oh, okay. And then once you're done and you want to show this program off to your friends, you can just remove that code. But that's it. That's all of these concepts are things that we've gone over in the previous lessons. Importing functions, print and input, assignment statements, uh, doing for loops, converting to integers or to strings, and then also if, elif, and else, and break, st break statements. All of this is just taking all of these concepts that we've learned and just mixing them all together, kind of like following a recipe and cooking up a meal from ingredients. This is lesson 13, which is, roughly covers pages 79 to 87 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. So in this lesson, we're going to cover lists. A list is a value that contains values. It contains multiple values 
in an ordered sequence. The values inside a list are sometimes called items. Typed out as code, a list begins and ends with square brackets, just like a string begins and ends with quotes. The values in the list are separated with commas, that is, the items are comma delimited. So we can have a bunch of string values separated by commas, like cat, bat, rat, and elephant. This is a list value that contains four values. You can assign it to a variable just like any other value. So spam equals, I'll just copy and paste this. So when I type spam as an expression, like any other variable, it evaluates to the value inside of it, uh, inside of the variable, which is this list value. In order to access an item in a list, you use an integer index for the item's position in the list. The index also begins and ends with square brackets. So we could have something like spam zero. This isn't a list, it's the index because it comes after a, a list value. And the first item is at index zero. So this expression evaluates to cat, which is the first item in that list. We can do this with we can do this with all of the indexes in this list. And we can see how this evaluates using the evaluation visualization tool. Here we have spam is set to that list value and spam index zero evaluates like this. First, the spam variable evaluates to the list inside of it. And then this entire list and index combination evaluates to the item inside the list at that index. Same thing here for the index of one. Spam evaluates to the list, and then this evaluates to the value at index one. Lists can also contain other list values. The values in these lists of lists can be accessed using multiple indexes. So if we had a spam variable that contained a list, and inside this list was another list, say, one that contained two strings, cat and bat. And then we had a second list that was, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. In that case, index zero would just be that first list value, since this is the first item in the entire list. And then we could have additional indexes to evaluate to the item inside that list in the list. So we can use the visualization tool there. We have that list of lists stored in spam. So spam evaluates to the list value inside of itself. And then this index evaluates to that first list. And this index evaluates to that value inside the list of lists. And the same thing here when we try to get the index one, index four, inside of spam. Spam evaluates to that list value. This index evaluates to the item inside that list. And we have another index here, so that evaluates to the item inside that list. And while indexes start at zero and go up, you can also use negative integers for the index in Python. These count from the end going backwards. The integer value negative one refers to the last index in the list and the value negative two refers to the second to last index in the list, and so on. Let's come up with a list value. I'll just copy and paste this. The negative one index refers to the last item in the list. And negative two refers to the second to last item. And we can use lists and index inside of expressions just like any other value. So if we have an expression that does string concatenation like this, we can see that all of these evaluate to the strings inside of the spam list, which are then concatenated with the other strings which then evaluates this single string value here. 
the elephant is afraid of the bat. Just as an index gets a single value from a list, a slice can get several values from a list. Like an index, a slice is typed between square brackets, but it also has two integers separated by a colon for the start and end indexes. So a slice has two indexes inside of it. So the slice 1, 3 starts at the index 1 and goes up to, but does not include, the value at index 3. So these values are returned in the slice and they're returned as a list value themselves. It's a brand new list created from the previous list. So just keep that in mind, an index evaluates to a single item in a list, whereas a slice will evaluate to a new list value. Remember how we can assign values to a variable if we put that variable on the left side of this assignment operator. So here, spam now contains the string value hello. We can do the same thing with indexes and slices. So if I set the spam variable to be this list value 10, 20, 30, I could then use an index to assign a new value to an item in the list. So here, spam1 means I want to assign the value that's at index1 to be set to this new value, hello. And the same can be done with multiple values in the list by using a slice. So if I have spam13, and I'll re replace it with uh, cat, dog, mouse. This means take this spam list and starting at index 1 and going up to but not including index 3, which is beyond the length of the, uh, beyond the last index of the list, so basically replace these two values with these three values. So we can assign a slice to a new list and that will change the items in the list. And as a shortcut, you can leave out one or both of the indexes on either side of the colon in a slice. So leaving out the first index is the same as using zero or the beginning of the list, and leaving out the second index is the same as using the length of the list, which will slice to the end of the list. Enter the following into the interactive shell to see what I mean. We have the variable spam be set to a new list value containing these four strings. And if we wanted to have a slice that starts at the very beginning, normally we would press zero, but we could just leave that out entirely. And Python will realize that by having this blank for the first index in a slice, we mean, oh, start at the very beginning. So this will go uh, start at the beginning and go up to, but not including the item at index two. Now this evaluates to cat bat. Meanwhile, if we leave out the second one, that means basically grab all the values up to the end of the list. So starting at index one and going all the way to the end of the list, that will be our slice and it returns those three values. If you want to delete values from a list, use a del statement. So I can have this list value stored in spam, but say I wanted to delete uh, this rat string from the list, I could say del spam index two, and that value gets deleted from the list. All of the items after that get moved up one, so it doesn't leave any gaps in the list. So if I ran del spam2, it would delete the item at index 2, which is now elephant, which is why now the spam list only contains cat and bat. You can think of the del statement as an unassignment statement. It's the opposite of the assignment statement. So in previous lessons, we talked about the len function, which returns the number of characters in a string. If you had len hello, this would evaluate to 5. But you can also pass len a list to return the number of items in a list. So if I passed it a list 1, 2, 3, it would return 3 because that's how many items are in this list that we passed it. And just like you can do string concatenation, 
with the plus operator, you can also do list concatenation with the plus operator. And the same applies for doing string replication. Remember that was when we could multiply a string by an integer, and that would evaluate to a new, bigger string. You can do the same thing with list replication. In fact, many of the things that you can do with strings, Python also lets you do with lists. You can think of a string value as a list of single character values. In fact, there's a list function that returns a list form of the value that you pass it. This is sort of the same thing as when we need to convert a string to an integer with the int function, or convert an integer or some other value to a string with the str function. We also have a list function. We could pass it a value like hello, and it'll return a list with each of these values coming from the original string. If you need to determine whether a value is or isn't in a list, you can use the in and not in operators. Like other operators, in and not in are used in expressions and connect two values. So there's a value that you're looking for, and then the in operator, and then the list value where it might be found. So we can see that howdy in this list, hello, hi, howdy, hey is, evaluates to true because this string can in fact be found inside of that list. Whereas if we had something like the string cat or maybe the integer 42 inside that same list, it would evaluate to false. And the not in, the not in operator does the exact opposite. We can copy and paste this expression not in. This will evaluate to false because the this value here is found inside the list, so not in will evaluate it to false. So to recap, a list is a value that contains multiple values. The values in the list are also called items. And you can access items in a list with its integer index. And remember, the first index is 0, not 1. You can also use negative indexes. Negative 1 refers to the last item, negative 2 refers to the second to last item, and so on. You can get multiple items from the list using a slice. The new list items start at the first index and go up to, but don't include, the second index. The len function, concatenation, and replication work the same way with lists that, and the way that they do with strings. And you can convert a value into a list by passing it to the list function. This is Lesson 13, which is, roughly covers pages 79 to 87 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. So in this lesson, we're going to cover lists. A list is a value that contains values. It contains multiple values in an ordered sequence. The values inside a list are sometimes called items. Typed out as code, a list begins and ends with square brackets, just like a string begins and ends with quotes. The values in the list are separated with commas. That is, the items are comma delimited. So we can have a bunch of string values separated by commas, like cat, bat, rat, and elephant. This is a list value that contains four values. You can assign it to a variable just like any other value. So spam equals, I'll just copy and paste this, so when I type spam as an expression, like any other variable, it evaluates to the value inside of it, uh, inside of the variable, which is this list value. In order to access an item in a list, you use an integer index for the item's position in the list. The index also begins and ends with square brackets. So we could have something like spam zero. This isn't a list, it's the index because it comes after a, a list value. And the first item is at index zero. So this expression evaluates to cat, which is the first item in that list. We can do this with, we can do this with all of the indexes in this list. And we can see how this evaluates using the evaluation visualization tool. Here we have spam is set to that list value, and spam index 0 evaluates like this. First, the spam variable 
evaluates to the list inside of it. And then this entire list and index combination evaluates to the item inside the list at that index. Same thing here for the index of one. Spam evaluates to the list, and then this evaluates to the value at index one. Lists can also contain other list values. The values in these lists of lists can be accessed using multiple indexes. So if we had a spam variable that contained a list, and inside this list was another list, say one that contained two strings, cat and bat, and then we had a second list that was, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. In that case, index zero would just be that first list value, since this is the first item in the entire list. And then we could have additional indexes to evaluate to the item inside that list in the list. So we can use the visualization tool there. We have that list of lists stored in spam. So spam evaluates to the list value inside of itself. And then this index evaluates to that first list. And this index evaluates to that value inside the list of lists. And the same thing here when we try to get the index one, index four inside of spam. Spam evaluates to that list value. This index evaluates to the item inside that list. And we have another index here. So that evaluates to the item inside that list. And while indexes start at zero and go up, you can also use negative integers for the index in Python. These count from the end going backwards. The integer value negative one refers to the last index in the list, and the value negative two refers to the second to last index in the list, and so on. Let's come up with a list value. I'll just copy and paste this. The negative one index refers to the last item in the list, and negative two refers to the second to last item. And we can use lists and index inside of expressions just like any other value. So if we have an expression that does string concatenation like this, We can see that all of these evaluate to the strings inside of the spam list, which are then concatenated with the other strings, which then evaluates to this single string value here. The elephant is afraid of the bat. Just as an index gets a single value from a list, a slice can get several values from a list. Like an index, a slice is typed between square brackets, but it also has two integers separated by a colon for the start and end indexes. So a slice has two indexes inside of it. So the slice one three starts at the index one and goes up to, but does not include the value at index three. So these values are returned in the slice and they're returned as a list value themselves. It's a brand new list created from the previous list. So just keep that in mind, an index evaluates to a single item in a list, whereas a slice will evaluate to a new list value. Remember how we can assign values to a variable if we put that variable on the left side of this assignment operator. So here, spam now contains the string value hello. We can do the same thing with indexes and slices. So if I set the spam variable to be this list value 10, 20, 30, I could then use an index to assign a new value to an item in the list. So here, spam one means I want to assign the value that's at index one to be set to this new value, hello. And the same can be done with multiple values in the list by using a slice. So if I have spam 
one three, and I'll re replace it with uh, cat dog mouse. This means take this spam list and starting at index one and going up to but not including index three, which is beyond the length of the uh, beyond the last index of the list. So basically, replace these two values with these three values. So we can assign a slice to a new list, and that will change the items in the list. And as a shortcut, you can leave out one or both of the indexes on either side of the colon in a slice. So leaving out the first index is the same as using zero or the beginning of the list, and leaving out the second index is the same as using the length of the list, which will slice to the end of the list. So enter the following into the interactive shell to see what I mean. We have the variable spam be set to a new list value containing these four strings. And if we wanted to have a slice that starts at the very beginning, normally we would press zero, but we could just leave that out entirely. And Python will realize that by having this blank for the first index in a slice, we mean, oh, start at the very beginning. So this will go uh, start at the beginning and go up to, but not including the item at index two. Now this evaluates to cat bat. Meanwhile, if we leave out the second one, that means basically grab all the values up to the end of the list. So starting at index one and going all the way to the end of the list, that will be our slice. And it returns those three values. If you want to delete values from a list, use a del statement. So I can have this list value stored in spam, but say I wanted to delete uh, this rat string from the list, I could say del spam index two, and that value gets deleted from the list. All of the items after that get moved up one, so it doesn't leave any gaps in the list. So if I ran del spam two, it would delete the item at index two, which is now elephant, which is why now the spam list only contains cat and bat. You can think of the del statement as an unassignment statement. It's the opposite of the assignment statement. So in previous lessons, we talked about the len function, which returns the number of characters in a string. If you had len hello, this would evaluate to five, but you can also pass len a list to return the number of items in a list. So if I passed it a list one, two, three, it would return three because that's how many items are in this list that we passed it. And just like you can do string concatenation with the plus operator, you can also do list concatenation with the plus operator. And the same applies for doing string replication. Remember that was when we could multiply a string by an integer and that would evaluate to a new bigger string. You can do the same thing with list replication. In fact, many of the things that you can do with strings, Python also lets you do with lists. You can think of a string value as a list of single character values. In fact, there's a list function that returns a list form of the value that you pass it. This is sort of the same thing as when we need to convert a string to an integer with the int function, or convert an integer or some other value to a string with the str function. We also have a list function we could pass it a value like hello, and it'll return a list with each of these values coming from the original string. If you need to determine whether a value is or isn't in a list, you can use the in and not in operators. Like other operators, in and not in are used in expressions and connect two values. So there's a value that you're looking for, and then the in operator and then the list value where it might be found. So we can see that howdy in this list, hello, hi, howdy, hey is, evaluates to true because this string can in fact be found inside of that list. Whereas if we had something like the string cat or maybe the integer 42 inside that same list, it would evaluate to false. 
And the not in the not in operator does the exact opposite. We can copy and paste this expression. Not in. This will evaluate to false because the this value here is found inside the list. So not in will evaluate it to false. So to recap, a list is a value that contains multiple values. The values in the list are also called items. And you can access items in a list with its integer index. And remember, the first index is 0, not 1. You can also use negative indexes. Negative 1 refers to the last item, negative 2 refers to the second to last item, and so on. You can get multiple items from the list using a slice. The new list items start at the first index and go up to, but don't include, the second index. The len function, concatenation, and replication work the same way with lists that, and the way that they do with strings. And you can convert a value into a list by passing it to the list function. Welcome to lesson 14, which roughly covers pages 86 to 88 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we're going to cover a few different topics using for loops with lists, multiple assignment, and the augmented assignment operators. In lesson 7, you learned about using for loops to execute a block of code a certain number of times. So if you had something like for i in range 4, and the block of code was just print i, this would output 0, 1, 2, 3. But technically, a for loop repeats the code block once for each value in a list or list-like value. Let's take a closer look at this range function. You can see range 4 returns a value that's of the data type called a range object. And range objects are a list-like values. Python considers this range object to be similar to the list 0, 1, 2, 3. In fact, you could write a for loop like this, 0, 1, 2, 3, and this would do the exact same thing as the previous list. So what Python is doing is it takes this list value and says, okay, I'll assign the first item to the variable i and then run the block of code. And then after that's done, I'll assign the second item in the list to the variable i and then run that block of code again. And it'll just keep doing this for all of these. I use the term list-like to refer to data types that are technically named sequences in Python, but you don't need to know the technical definitions of these terms. Now, if you want to get the actual list value from a range object value, then you can just pass that to the list function. It'll return an actual list for you. This can also be really handy if you need to get a collection of integers in a list. So instead of just typing out, say, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on, up to you know something really huge like 100, you could just pass this range object and say start at 0, go up to, but not including 100, and then step twice so that it counts up by 2 instead of 1. And so here's a nice list value. We can assign that to a variable just like any other value. One common Python technique is to use range and then pass it the return value of len and then pass it and pass that some list value and then use that inside of a for loop. I'll show you what I mean with some sample code. Say that we had a variable supplies which contained a list of strings describing uh, typical office equipment that we had. So we can have the string pens, staplers, flamethrowers, and binders. Typical office stuff. We're going to have a for loop that instead of just going through range of something, we could pass this range function the length of supplies. And now we can use i as an index for the supplies list inside this block of code. So we could have something like print uh, index whatever i is. i is an integer, so we need to convert it to a string before we can concatenate it to these other strings. And supplies is
supplies I. And this prints out index 0 in supplies is pens, index 1 in supplies is staplers. So using this range, len, and then the list format inside of a for loop is kind of handy because then we can use this uh, for loop variable i to refer to both the index, if we ever need the integer index while we go through the loop, and then we can also just have that list value with the index i to get the value inside the loop inside the list. So if you ever need to run loop code over a list where you need both the value inside of it and also the integer index, you can just use this range len and then whatever list variable format. And one good thing about this is that the list can be of any size whatsoever and this same code will work. So even if I had supplies equals pens and pens and pens and pens and pens, lots of pens. You know, this is a pretty huge list that we have right here. I can use this exact same code. I'll just copy and paste it. And it will still work. So this range lens supplies works no matter what the size of the supplies list is. Python also has a multiple assignment trick, and it's a nice little shortcut. So say we had a list in the variable cat that of strings that just describe a cat, fat, orange, loud. And say we wanted to put all of these items inside of separate variables. So we have a size variable, uh, we'd have to set it to cat zero, maybe a color variable for cat one. We would have to have three separate lines of code for this, uh, and that could get kind of hairy once we have very, very long lists. But Python has a multiple assignment trick where you could just have multiple variables on the left side of the assignment operator separated by commas, and then just have a list value. And this will automatically do the same thing as this, except in one line of code. So it just says, okay, I'll take the first item in this list cat and assign it to the first variable on the left side of the op assignment operator. And then the second value inside that list will be assigned to the second variable, and so on. Another thing with the multiple assignment trick is that you could have multiple variables on the left side, but also have multiple values on the right side. Just separate those with commas as well. So if I had skinny, black, quiet to describe my cat, I could assign multiple variables to multiple values in one line of code. This is often used to do swap operations with variables. So we have a variable a, which contains this string aaa, and a variable b, which contains the value bbb. Say I wanted to put this string inside of this variable, and meanwhile take this string and put it inside this variable. I could do that with the multiple assignment trick by just saying a comma b equals b comma a, and all of a sudden Python will automatically do that swap for us. One more shortcut that Python has is augmented assignment operators. So when you're assigning a value to a variable, you'll frequently use the variable itself. Say if you wanted to increment the value inside of, uh, inside of a variable, spam is 42 and we want to increase that by one, we would have to have spam equals spam plus one. And this is something that you do fairly commonly in programming. So Python and other languages have something called augmented assignment operators, where it's just a little shortcut so that you don't have to retype the variable name. You can just have spam plus equals one. And that means take the variable spam and then just add one to it. So you can see spam was 42, I incremented it here, but this code does the exact same thing, it increments it again. And there are augmented assignment operators for plus, minus, uh, multiplication, division, and the modulus operators. You can see them here in table 4-1 of the automate textbook. So to recap, for loops technically iterate over the values in a list. Uh, the range function returns a list-like value, and if you need the actual list 
of that, you can pass that range object to the list function. Variables can swap their values using multiple assignment, and the augmented assignment operators, like plus equals, are used as shortcuts just to change the value of a variable based on its current value. Welcome to lesson 14, which roughly covers pages 86 to 88 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, we're going to cover a few different topics using for loops with lists, multiple assignment, and the augmented assignment operators. In lesson 7, you learned about using for loops to execute a block of code a certain number of times. So if you had something like for i in range 4, and the block of code was just print i, this would output 0, 1, 2, 3. But technically, a for loop repeats the code block once for each value in a list or list-like value. Let's take a closer look at this range function. You can see range 4 returns a value that's of the data type called a range object. And range objects are a list-like values. Python considers this range object to be similar to the list 0, 1, 2, 3. In fact, you could write a for loop like this, 0, 1, 2, 3, and this would do the exact same thing as the previous list. So what Python is doing is it takes this list value and says, okay, I'll assign the first item to the variable i and then run the block of code, and then after that's done, I'll assign the second item in the list to the variable i and then run that block of code again, and it'll just keep doing this for all of these. I use the term list-like to refer to data types that are technically named sequences in Python, but you don't need to know the technical definitions of these terms. Now if you want to get the actual list value from a range object value, then you can just pass that to the list function. and It'll return an actual list for you. This can also be really handy if you need to get a collection of integers in a list. So instead of just typing out, say, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on, up to, you know, something really huge like 100, you could just pass this range object and say, start at 0, go up to, but not including 100, and then step twice so that it counts up by 2 instead of 1. And so here's a nice list value. We can assign that to a variable just like any other value. One common Python technique is to use range and then pass it the return value of len and then pass it and pass that some list value and then use that inside of a for loop. I'll show you what I mean with some sample code. Say that we had a variable supplies which contained a list of strings describing uh, typical office equipment that we had. So we can have the string pens staplers, flamethrowers, and binders. Typical office stuff. We're going to have a for loop that instead of just going through range of something, we could pass this range function the length of supplies. And now we can use i as an index for the supplies list inside this block of code. So we could have something like print uh, index whatever i is. i is an integer, so we need to convert it to a string before we can concatenate it to these other strings. And supplies is supplies i. And this prints out index 0 in supplies is pens, index 1 in supplies is staplers. So using this range, len, and then the list format inside of a for loop is kind of handy because then we can use this uh, for loop variable i to refer to both the index, if we ever need the integer index while we go through the loop, and then we can also just have that list value with the index i to get the value inside the loop inside the list. So if you ever need to run loop code over a list where you need both the value inside of it and also the integer index, you can just use this range len 
and then whatever list variable format. And one good thing about this is that the list can be of any size whatsoever, and this same code will work. So even if I had supplies equals pens and pens and pens and pens and pens, lots of pens, you know, this is a pretty huge list that we have right here. I can use this exact same code. I'll just copy and paste it. And it will still work. So this range length supplies works no matter what the size of the supplies list is. Python also has a multiple assignment trick, and it's a nice little shortcut. So say we had a list in the variable cat that of strings that just describe a cat. Fat, orange, loud. And say we wanted to put all of these items inside of separate variables. So we have a size variable, uh, we'd have to set it to cat zero, maybe a color variable for cat one. We would have to have three separate lines of code for this. Uh, and that could get kind of hairy once we have very, very long lists. But Python has a multiple assignment trick where you could just have multiple variables on the left side of the assignment operator separated by commas and then just have a list value and this will automatically do the same thing as this except in one line of code so it just says okay I'll take the first item in this list cat and assign it to the first variable on the left side of the op assignment operator and then the second value inside that list will be assigned to the second variable and so on another thing with the multiple assignment trick is that you could have multiple variables on the left side, but also have multiple values on the right side. Just separate those with commas as well. So if I had skinny, black, quiet to describe my cat, I could assign multiple variables to multiple values in one line of code. This is often used to do swap operations with variables. So we have a variable a which contains this string aaa and a variable b which contains the value bbb say i wanted to put this string inside of this variable and meanwhile take this string and put it inside this variable i could do that with the multiple assignment trick by just saying a comma b equals b comma a and all of a sudden python will automatically do that swap for us one more shortcut that Python has is augmented assignment operators. So when you're assigning a value to a variable, you'll frequently use the variable itself. Say if you wanted to increment the value inside of, uh, inside of a variable, spam is 42 and we want to increase that by one, we would have to have spam equals spam plus one. And this is something that you do fairly commonly in programming. So Python and other languages have something called augmented assignment operators where it's just a little shortcut so that you don't have to retype the variable name. You can just have spam plus equals one, and that means take the variable spam and then just add one to it. So you can see spam was 42, I incremented it here, but this code does the exact same thing. It increments it again. And there are augmented assignment operators for plus, minus, uh, multiplication, division, and the modulus operators. You can see them here in table 4-1 of the automate textbook. So to recap, for loops technically iterate over the values in a list. Uh, the range function returns a list-like value, and if you need the actual list of that, you can pass that range object to the list function. Variables can swap their values using multiple assignment, and the augmented assignment operators, like plus equals, are used as shortcuts just to change the value of a variable based on its current value. Hello, this is lesson 15, which covers pages 89 to 92 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, I'm going to introduce a new concept called methods. A method is the same thing as a function, except it's attached or called on a certain value. I'll show you what I mean in the interactive shell. Let's store a list value in this variable spam. So hello, hi, 
Howdy, hey is. So spam has a list with four values in it. Now, all list values have a method called index. And remember, method is just this, pretty much the same thing as a function. And you can call that method on the, on the list value in spam. So here we're calling index, that's the name of the method. And we're gonna pass it an argument, just like we would pass a function in argument. And the index method returns the index that it finds that value that you passed at. So hello is at index zero, so the index method returns zero. So you can't call a method by itself. Like this doesn't really make any sense. And also Python doesn't know which list you're trying to find the index to. That's why you have to call it on a value right here. So the method name comes after the value or the variable that contains the value and a dot. Other than that, it's pretty much the exact same thing as a function. And each data type has its own set of methods. So the list data type, for example, has several useful methods for finding, adding, removing, and otherwise manipulating values in the list. And we'll cover those in this lesson. Let's see, we can also call the index on this value. So if you ever said, hey, I need to find where this string hey is in the, in the spam list, you can call the index method. However, if the value that you're searching for the index for doesn't exist inside that list, just like this string doesn't exist in the spam list, uh, the index method will raise an exception. And if you have a list with duplicate values inside of it, say, I have the name of various cats I know, Sophie, Puka, Fat Tail, and then have a duplicate value inside this list, if you call the index method searching for that value, the index method will return the index of the first time it sees that value inside the list. It'll return that index. To add new values to a list, use the append and insert methods. The append list method adds the value to the end of a list. So let's have a list cat, dog, bat. We can call the append method and it'll add a value to the end of that list. And the insert method is similar, it just can insert a value at any point inside the list. So if we have, so let me restart this. Spam is equal to this list with these three values. We could call the insert method and say I want to insert this as the new value at index one. I want to add chicken that will then insert that value at index one in the list and everything else gets bumped up. Now notice that we don't assign the return values of append and insert to the variable. Now, these methods just return the none value anyway. So we type something like spam append moose, but we don't type spam equals spam dot append moose. This would actually assign the none value to spam and get rid of that list entirely. So, so the list is modified, quote, in place. So modifying a list in place is covered in more detail later when we talk about mutable and immutable data types. But for right now, just realize that you don't assign the return value of append and insert. You just call the method itself. Methods belong to a single data type. The append and insert methods are list methods and can only be called on list values. They can't be called on values such as strings or integers. If we tried to do something like assign eggs the string value hello and then tried eggs.append world, this would raise an error. That's because the string data type doesn't have a method called append. So lists also have a remove method that's passed a value that you want removed from the list that it's called on. So let's create a new list, say cat, bat, rat, elephant, and say I want to remove that bat value from the list. Doesn't matter where it is in the list, I just want to remove it. We can call spam.remove bat. 
and that removes the bat string from that list. Now if we try to remove a value that doesn't exist in the list, Python gives us an error. So notice how this is different from using the delete statement. If I wanted to delete the value, no matter what it is, at index 0, I would just say delete spam 0. But what the remove method does is that it allows you to specify a value that you want to remove rather than the index, and it'll remove this value no matter where it is in the list. And like the index method, if a value appears multiple times in a list, only the first instance of that value will be removed. So if I had a list in the spam variable like cat, bat, rat, cat, hat, cat, and cat appears multiple times if I call spam remove cat, it will only remove this first cat variable that it found. All of the other cats are still inside that list. Now lists with number values or lists with string values can be sorted with the sort method. This is really handy. Say I had something like a list with these values in it, 2, 5, 3.14, 1, negative 7. I could then sort these just by calling spam.sort, the sort list method. And now all of these are suddenly rearranged to be in order. You can do the same thing with lists that have strings. So say I had ants, cats, dogs, badgers, which begins with a B, so this is not in alphabetical order anymore, elephants, I could call spam.sort, and then all of a sudden all of these are sorted in alphabetical order. And you can also pass a keyword argument to sort, the reverse keyword argument, which takes a boolean value. So I can say reverse equals true, and that means I want this sorted in reverse order. So now it's in reverse alphabetical order. But note that you can't sort lists that have both numbers and string values, since Python doesn't really know how to compare these values. So if I had a list that was 1, 2, 3, and also had strings, Alice, Bob, and I tried to sort them, Python would give us an error message saying, I really don't know how to sort these string and integer types. I mean, so does a string that begins with the letter A, does that come before the number one? or do I put integers after this? Uh, Python doesn't really know, so it just says I can't sort these. Technically, sort doesn't use alphabetical order. It uses something called ASCII-betical order. Uh, and it's pretty much the same thing, but it just means that uppercase characters come before lowercase characters. I'll show you what I mean. We have a list value that has capital A Alice and capital B Bob, lowercase a ants and lowercase b badgers, and capital C carol and lowercase c cats. When we sort this, something odd happens. All of the uppercase letters come first, while all the lowercase characters come afterwards. And this is weird because technically it means that a capital Z comes before a lowercase a. Now if you want true alphabetical sorting, there's a keyword argument that you can pass to the list. So let's say we had a list, lowercase a, lowercase z, uppercase a, uppercase z. Normally this sorts in ASCII-betical order, where the capital letters come first. But you could pass the keyword argument key equals stir lower. This is technically passing the convert to lowercase string method, which we'll go over in a future lesson. But that will make it sort in true alphabetical order. So just remember, dot sort, uh, call the sort method, and then pass it key equals string dot lower. To recap, methods are functions that are called on values. And the index list method returns the index of an item in the list. The append list method adds a value to the end of a list, and the insert list method can add a value to the list 
anywhere at any index. And the remove list method removes an item, which is specified by the value. And the sort list method sorts the items in a list. And you can pass the sort method's reverse keyword argument to cause it to sort in reverse order. And also, sorting happens technically in ASCII-betical order. If you want to sort it in normal alphabetical order, pass key equals string.lower, and the list methods operate on a list in place rather than returning a new list value. That's why you just want to call spam.append instead of spam equals spam.append. Hello, this is Lesson 15, which covers pages 89 to 92 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. In this lesson, I'm going to introduce a new concept called methods. A method is the same thing as a function, except it's attached or called on a certain value. I'll show you what I mean in the interactive shell. Let's store a list value in this variable spam. So hello, hi, howdy, hey is. So spam has a list with four values in it. Now, all list values have a method called index, and remember, method is just this, pretty much the same thing as a function. And you can call that method on the, on the list value in spam. So here we're calling index, that's the name of the method. And we're going to pass it an argument, just like we would pass a function an argument. And the index method returns the index that it finds that value that you passed at. So hello is at index 0, so the index method returns 0. So you can't call a method by itself. Like this doesn't really make any sense. And also Python doesn't know which list you're trying to find the index to. That's why you have to call it on a value right here. So the method name comes after the value or the variable that contains the value and a dot. Other than that, it's pretty much the exact same thing as a function. And each data type has its own set of methods. So the list data type, for example, has several useful methods for finding, adding, removing, and otherwise manipulating values in the list. And we'll cover those in this lesson. Let's see, we can also call the index on this value. So if you ever said, hey, I need to find where this string hey is in the, in the spam list, you can call the index method. However, if the value that you're searching for the index for doesn't exist inside that list, just like this string doesn't exist in the spam list, uh, the index method will raise an exception. And if you have a list with duplicate values inside of it, say I have the name of various cats I know, Sophie, Puka, Fat Tail, and then have a duplicate value inside this list, if you call the index method searching for that value, the index method will return the index of the first time it sees that value inside the list. It'll return that index. To add new values to a list, use the append and insert methods. The append list method adds the value to the end of a list. So let's have a list cat, dog, bat. We can call the append method and it'll add a value to the end of that list. And the insert method is similar, it just can insert a value at any point inside the list. So if we have, so let me restart this. Spam is equal to this list with these three values. We could call the insert method and say I want to insert this as the new value at index one. I want to add chicken. That will then insert that value at index one in the list and everything else gets bumped up. Now notice that we don't assign the return values of append and insert to the variable. Now, these methods just return the none value anyway. So we type something like spam append moose, but we don't type spam equals spam.append moose. This would actually assign the none value to spam and get rid of that list entirely. So the list is modified, quote, in place. So modifying a list in place is covered in more detail later when we talk about mutable and immutable data types. 
But for right now, just realize that you don't assign the return value of append and insert. You just call the method itself. Methods belong to a single data type. The append and insert methods are list methods and can only be called on list values. They can't be called on values such as strings or integers. If we tried to do something like assign eggs the string value hello and then tried eggs.append world, this would raise an error. That's because the string data type doesn't have a method called append. So lists also have a remove method that's passed a value that you want removed from the list that it's called on. So let's create a new list, say cat, bat, rat, elephant, and say I want to remove that bat value from the list. Doesn't matter where it is in the list, I just want to remove it. We can call spam.remove bat, and that removes the bat string from that list. Now if we try to remove a value that doesn't exist in the list, Python gives us an error. So notice how this is different from using the delete statement. If I wanted to delete the value, no matter what it is, at index 0, I would just say delete spam 0. But what the remove method does is that it allows you to specify a value that you want to remove rather than the index, and it will remove this value no matter where it is in the list. And like the index method, if a value appears multiple times in a list, only the first instance of that value will be removed. So if I had a list in the spam variable like cat, bat, rat, cat, hat, cat, and cat appears multiple times if I call spam remove cat, it will only remove this first cat variable that it found. All of the other cats are still inside that list. Now lists with number values or lists with string values can be sorted with the sort method. This is really handy. Say I had something like a list with these values in it, 2, 5, 3.14, 1, negative 7. I could then sort these just by calling spam.sort, the sort list method. And now all of these are suddenly rearranged to be in order. You can do the same thing with lists that have strings. So say I had ants, cats, dogs, badgers, which begins with a B, so this is not in alphabetical order anymore, elephants, I could call spam.sort, and then all of a sudden all of these are sorted in alphabetical order. And you can also pass a keyword argument to sort, the reverse keyword argument, which takes a boolean value. So I can say reverse equals true, and that means I want this sorted in reverse order. So now it's in reverse alphabetical order. But note that you can't sort lists that have both numbers and string values, since Python doesn't really know how to compare these values. So if I had a list that was one, two, three, and also had strings, Alice, Bob, and I tried to sort them, Python would give us an error message saying, I really don't know how to sort these string and integer types. I mean, so does a string that begins with the letter A, does that come before the number one, or do I put integers after this? Uh, Python doesn't really know, so it just says, I can't sort these. Technically, sort doesn't use alphabetical order. It uses something called ASCII-betical order. Uh, and it's pretty much the same thing, but it just means that uppercase characters come before lowercase characters. I'll show you what I mean. We have a list value that has capital A Alice and capital B Bob, lowercase A ants and lowercase B badgers, and capital C Carol and lowercase C cats. When we sort this, something odd happens. All of the uppercase letters come first, while all the lowercase characters come afterwards. 
And this is weird because technically it means that a capital Z comes before a lowercase a. Now if you want true alphabetical sorting, there's a keyword argument that you can pass to the list. So let's say we had a list, lowercase a, lowercase z, uppercase a, uppercase z. Normally this sorts in ASCII-betical order where the capital letters come first. But you could pass the keyword argument key equals stir lower. This is technically passing the convert to lowercase string method, which we'll go over in a future lesson. But that will make it sort in true alphabetical order. So just remember, dot sort, uh, call the sort method, and then pass it key equals string dot lower. To recap, methods are functions that are called on values. And the index list method returns the index of an item in the list. The append list method adds a value to the end of a list, and the insert list method can add a value to the list anywhere at any index. And the remove list method removes an item, which is specified by the value. And the sort list method sorts the items in a list. And you can pass the sort method's reverse keyword argument to cause it to sort in reverse order. And also, sorting happens technically in ASCII-betical order. If you want to sort it in normal alphabetical order, pass key equals string.lower. And the list methods operate on a list in place rather than returning a new list value. That's why you just want to call spam.append instead of spam equals spam.append. Hello, welcome. This is lesson 16, which roughly covers pages 93 to 103 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. So lists aren't the only data types that re represent ordered sequences of values. For example, strings and lists are actually similar if you consider a string to be a list of single character strings. In fact, you can even see that by passing a string to the list function to convert it to a list. Many of the things that you can do with lists, you can also do with strings. Indexing, slicing, using them with a for loop, uh, the len function, the in and not in operators. You can see if I have a string stored in name, I can use indexing to pick out single individual characters from that, or slices to pick out multiple characters. I can use negative indexes. I can even use the in and not in operators, so zo in name will reply with true, whereas xxx in name will evaluate to false. And even something like for letter in name, I can then print that out. But lists and strings are different in an important way. A list value is a mutable data type. It can have values added, removed, or changed. However, a string value is immutable. It cannot be changed. This is why if you have something like Sophie the cat, stored in a string. You can use indexing to access a letter from that string, but you can't reassign letters in that string. Python will give you, a, give you an error message. Remember, strings in Python are immutable. They can't be changed. The proper way to modify a string is to create a new string using slices. So if I have a string Zophie a cat, and I wanted to change that to Zophie the cat, what I would have to do is create a new string, and I'll just store that in a new variable called new name. And I'll have to use slices to pick out the parts of the old string that I want. So I want 0 to 7, and I'll concatenate that with this string v, and then have the parts after that that I want. So 0 to 7, and then 8 to 12 will leave out this letter A, and it replaces it effectively with that string V. Now this might seem a bit overly complicated. It'd be nice if Python just let you change this, but there's an important difference between mutable and immutable values in Python. So as you've seen before, variables store strings and integer values like this, spam equals 42. You can have something like cheese equals spam. 
maybe update spam variable. So spam equals 100 and then cheese, which we had assigned here to be spam back when spam was equal to 42, will then be uh, set to the value 42. This is basically just, you know, whatever value this expression evaluates to is the value that gets copied into the cheese variable. But lists don't quite work this way. When you assign a list to a variable, you're actually assigning a list reference to the variable. And a reference is a value that points to some bit of data like a list. Uh, here's some code in the interactive shell that'll make this distinction easier to understand. Say I have a variable spam, which contains this list of integers, just, you know, 0 to 5. And now I want to assign the variable cheese uh, basically that list, spam. This is pretty similar to what we did up here with the integers. And now let's say I'm going to change the item at index 1 in cheese to hello. And so we can see what cheese is now set to. This makes a lot of sense. I mean, we had assigned cheese this list, and then we just changed that so that hello string was in index 1. But here's something that's really weird. If we look at the spam variable, it's also been changed. We never had spam1 equals hello. We only, had, we only modified this cheese variable. So why is spam being modified as well? And this is because when you assigned this list value to spam, Python created this list and it's in the computer's memory, but it assigned a reference to this list to spam. So what this expression here evaluates to is a reference that gets copied to cheese, but even though we have two separate references, they're referencing the same list, which is why when you modify the, the list that's referred to by cheese, you're also modifying the list that re is referred to by spam, because they're the same list. Uh, figure 4.4 Figure 4-4 might make this a bit easier to understand. Here in that first step, we have spam equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this, behind the scenes, Python creates a list that's somewhere out in the computer's memory, and what it actually stores in the spam variable is a reference, and references have weird IDs that are really complicated. This is just something that Python internally has. In the next line, when you assign cheese equals spam, what you're actually doing is not copying this list value, you're actually just copying this reference to the cheese variable. But this reference still references the exact same list that spam is referencing right here. And that's why whenever you have cheese one equals hello, it's saying, okay, I'll just find this list that cheese is referring to, and then I'll update it to have hello string at index one. But as a side effect, that's also updating what the spam variable refers, uh, the list that the spam variable refers to. Now this can cause all sorts of weird little subtle bugs in your code if you don't remember that list that variables don't contain lists per se, they just contain references to the list. In fact, any immutable value isn't actually stored inside of a variable. This doesn't apply just to lists, it applies to any mutable value. You don't store mutable values inside the variable. What you're really storing inside the variable is a reference to that mutable value. Immutable values like strings and tuples don't have this problem. So let me bring up one case where this could lead to bugs if you don't have a clear understanding of what's happening with references. I'm going to open up a new file editor and enter this program. We have a function called eggs. It takes, I don't know, some parameter that will be a list. And we'll just call the append list method. So essentially this eggs function doesn't do anything really except just call the append method. So let's have a list that we store in a variable called spam, one, two, three, and then let's pass it to spam. Now, if you remember from our previous lesson about global and local scopes, you might think, oh, right, whenever we pass a value to some function like this, that's just copying it to the parameter which exists inside the local scope of this function. So after this function returns, this sum parameter uh, local variable will get destroyed. 
and all the changes that are made to it are also gone with it. But that's actually not is what happens here. We can print out spam. Just save this as example.py. When we print this out, it looks like this spam list, the changes that we make to it inside this function are actually reflected even outside the function. So here in this globe, uh, in this print function call that's in the global scope, it's still seeing the change that was made to this parameter in the local scope. And that's kind of weird, but let's think about this. Spam stores a reference to this list variable, and then when we pass a copy of that reference to assign it to some parameter. This is just like when we had spam and cheese right here. So this some parameter variable, in fact, let's just call this cheese to make it look like a previous example. So the reference here refers to the same list as this global spam variable. So even though it's true that the cheese variable gets destroyed after this function returns, but since it was making a change to the same to the same list that spam refers to, the changes in spam are reflected outside of the function. So if you don't really understand references and what's going on, this can lead to all sorts of weird bugs where you're thinking like, oh, that's weird. I thought I thought that print spam would just print out one, two, three, because I don't make any changes to it except inside this local scope, which should just be contained to that function. So just remember that for mutable data types, such as lists, you're actually storing a reference to that list inside of a variable. And then when you call a function or do an assignment, you're actually copying a reference to it. So it's actually referring to the same list. And any method calls or things that you do that modify that list in place, such as the append or insert or remove methods, are going to be operating on that particular, on that particular list. So you might ask, okay, I see that we have mutable and immutable data types, and those are important because of references, and those are important because if we don't understand that, it could lead to having these weird, unexpected bugs pop up in our code. But why does Python have this whole complicated reference system to begin with? And well, you have to consider, lists can be huge. In our code right here, it just has three integers. That's only a few bytes of your computer's memory. But say that this was, I don't know, four billion integers instead of just, you know, these three right here. Then it would be a huge problem to copy that entire list with all four billion values every time you make a function call right here. So as a default sort of shortcut, it just stores this list once and instead it just assigns a really cheap and easy to handle list reference to this variable. And then that list reference gets copied because it's just you know, a few bytes in memory. It just points to this what would be a gigantic 4 billion item list. And so that's a really computationally cheap thing for the computer to do. And that's why Python has that set up that way. Which is all well and good, but sometimes you actually might want to have a completely separate list. So how could you do that? Well, there's a module called the copy module. We can import that. And the copy module has a function called deep copy, which can make a total copy of this list. So it doesn't just copy the reference to this list. It actually creates a brand new list that just happens to have all the same values here. And it returns a, re a reference to this new list. So if we had say spam equals a list that has the letters A, B, C, D in it. And we wanted to copy that list and make a brand new copy, not just copy the list reference. We could call the copy modules deep copy function, pass spam to it. And what this does is it creates a brand new list based off of the values in this list and returns a reference to that new list. So now we can make all the changes we want to this cheese list because it's actually a separate list from the one in spam. So modifying cheese doesn't modify spam. That's kind of complicated. You might want to watch this video again just to go through why we have mutable and immutable data types and why we have references and the kind of tiny little bugs that can crop up if you don't quite understand what's happening with references. 
Uh, here's one more list concept that's fairly easy to understand. So in most cases, the amount of indentation for a line of code in Python tells what block it's in. But there's an exception to this rule. For example, lists can actually span multiple lines of code. So if I had a list that was like right here, I could actually begin this on a brand new line. And Python's not looking at this indentation to say, oh, this code is, uh, this code must be in a separate block. Python is smart enough to realize, oh, you're still in the middle of typing out this list. You just wanted to make this code look a little bit more readable by having everything line up like this. And it'll consider that to be a single line of code. This in particular is nice because if you have several dozen values, you don't need to cram it all on one line that just starts wrapping around. You can just make your code a little bit easier to read. In fact, you can do this even when you don't have lists by using the slash line continuation character. Now this is not the same as the division operator slash, but rather it's, it's the opposite slash. So you could have code that says four score and seven, and then I'm concatenating this string, but maybe I'm when I'm typing this out in the file editor, I'm running out of space over here, or I'm making this line too long. I can just add this slash And this line continuation slash character tells Python, okay, ignore the indentation on the next line. I'm just continuing this previous line. I'm not starting a new block or ending a block or anything like that. And then you can complete the rest of that Python instruction. We could have something like this. And this is basically the exact same as what this code does. It's just that line continuation slash says this line continues on the next line, so don't pay any attention to its indentation. But to recap, strings can do a lot of the same things that lists can do, it's just that strings are in mutable data type. Immutable values like strings can't be modified, quote, in place. Uh, mutable values like lists can be modified in place. And variables don't contain lists they actually contain references to lists. So when you're passing a list argument to a function, you're actually passing a list reference. And changes made to a list inside of a function will affect the list outside of the function. And finally, the slash line continuation character can be used to stretch Python instructions across multiple lines. Hello, welcome. This is lesson 16, which roughly covers pages 93 to 103 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. So lists aren't the only data types that re represent ordered sequences of values. For example, strings and lists are actually similar if you consider a string to be a list of single character strings. In fact, you can even see that by passing a string to the list function to convert it to a list. Many of the things that you can do with lists, you can also do with strings. Indexing, slicing, using them with a for loop, uh, the len function, the in and not in operators. You can see if I have a string stored in name, I can use indexing to pick out single individual characters from that, or slices to pick out multiple characters. I can use negative indexes. I can even use the in and not in operators, so zo in name will reply with true, whereas xxx in name will evaluate to false. And even something like for letter in name, I can then print that out. But lists and strings are different in an important way. A list value is a mutable data type. It can have values added, removed, or changed. However, a string value is immutable. It cannot be changed. This is why if you have something like Sophie the cat, stored in a string. You can use indexing to access a letter from that string, but you can't reassign letters in that string. Python will give you, a, give you an error message. Remember, strings in Python are immutable. They can't be changed. The proper way to modify a string is to create a new string using slices. 
So if I have a string Zofi a cat, and I wanted to change that to Zofi the cat, what I would have to do is create a new string, and I'll just store that in a new variable called new name. And I'll have to use slices to pick out the parts of the old string that I want. So I want 0 to 7, and I'll concatenate that with this string v, and then have the parts after that that I want. So 0 to 7 and then 8 to 12 will leave out this letter a, and it replaces it effectively with that string v. Now this might seem a bit overly complicated. It'd be nice if Python just let you change this, but there's an important difference between mutable and immutable values in Python. So as you've seen before, variables store strings and integer values like this, spam equals 42, you can have something like cheese equals spam, maybe update spam variable. So spam equals 100 and then cheese, which we had assigned here to be spam back when spam was equal to 42, will then be uh, set to the value 42. This is basically just, you know, whatever value this expression evaluates to is the value that gets copied into the cheese variable. But lists don't quite work this way. When you assign a list to a variable, you're actually assigning a list reference to the variable. And a reference is a value that points to some bit of data like a list. Now here's some code in the interactive shell that'll make this distinction easier to understand. See, I have a variable spam, which contains this list of integers, just, you know, 0 to 5. And now I want to assign the variable cheese uh, basically that list, spam. This is pretty similar to what we did up here with the integers. And now let's say I'm going to change the item at index 1 in cheese to hello. And so we can see what cheese is now set to. This makes a lot of sense. I mean, we had assigned cheese this list, and then we just changed that so that hello string was in index 1. But here's something that's really weird. If we look at the spam variable, it's also been changed. We never had spam1 equals hello. We only, had, we only modified this cheese variable, so why is spam being modified as well? And this is because when you assigned this list value to spam, Python created this list and it's in the computer's memory, but it assigned a reference to this list to spam. So what this expression here evaluates to is a reference that gets copied to cheese, but even though we have two separate references, they're referencing the same list, which is why when you modify the referent, the list that's referred to by cheese, you're also modifying the list that re is referred to by spam because they're the same list. Uh, figure 4.4 uh, figure 4 4 might make this a bit easier to understand. Here in that first step, we have spam equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this, behind the scenes, Python creates a list that's somewhere out in the computer's memory, and what it actually stores in the spam variable is a reference, and references have weird IDs that are really complicated. This is just something that Python internally has. In the next line, when you assign cheese equals spam, what you're actually doing is not copying this list value, you're actually just copying this reference to the cheese variable. But this reference still references the exact same list that the spam is referencing right here. And that's why whenever you have cheese1 equals hello, saying, okay, I'll just find this list that cheese is referring to, and then I'll update it to have hello string at index 1. But as a side effect, that's also updating what the spam variable refers, uh, the list that the spam variable refers to. Now this can cause all sorts of weird little subtle bugs in your code if you don't remember that list ver that variables don't contain lists per se they just contain references to the list in fact any immutable value isn't actually stored inside of a variable this doesn't apply just to lists it applies to any mutable value you don't store mutable values inside the variable what you're really re storing inside the variable is a reference to that mutable value immutable values like strings and tuples don't have this problem.
So let me bring up one case where this could lead to bugs if you don't have a clear understanding of what's happening with references. I'm going to open up a new file editor and enter this program. We have a function called eggs. It takes, I don't know, some parameter that will be a list. And we'll just call the append list method. So essentially this eggs function doesn't do anything really except just call the append method. So let's have a list that we store in a variable called spam, one, two, three, and then let's pass it to spam. Now if you remember from our previous lesson about global and local scopes, you might think, oh right, whenever we pass a value to some function like this, that's just copying it to the parameter which exists inside the local scope of this function. So after this function returns, this sum parameter uh, local variable will get destroyed. And all the changes that are made to it are also gone with it. But that's actually not is what happens here. We can print out spam. Just save this as example.py. When we print this out, it looks like this spam list the changes that we make to it inside this function are actually reflected even outside the function. So here in this global, uh, in this print function call that's in the global scope, it's still seeing the change that was made to this parameter in the local scope. And that's kind of weird, but let's think about this. Spam stores a reference to this list variable. And then when we pass a copy of that reference, to assign it to some parameter. This is just like when we had spam and cheese right here. So this some parameter variable, in fact, let's just call this cheese to make it look like our previous example. So the reference here refers to the same list as this global spam variable. So even though it's true that the cheese variable gets destroyed after this function returns, but since it was making a change to the same, to the same list that spam refers to, the changes in spam are reflected outside of the function. So if you don't really understand references and what's going on, this can lead to all sorts of weird bugs where you're thinking like, oh, that's weird. I thought I thought that print spam would just print out one, two, three, because I don't make any changes to it except inside this local scope, which should just be contained to that function. So just remember that for mutable data types, such as lists, you're actually storing a reference to that list inside of a variable. And then when you call a function or do an assignment, you're actually copying a reference to it. So it's actually referring to the same list. And any method calls or things that you do that modify that list in place, such as the append or insert or remove methods, are going to be operating on that particular, on that particular list. So you might ask, OK, I see that we have mutable and immutable data types, and those are important because of references, and those are important because if we don't understand that, it could lead to having these weird, unexpected bugs pop up in our code. But why does Python have this whole complicated reference system to begin with? And well, you have to consider, lists can be huge. In our code right here, it just has three integers. That's only a few bytes of your computer's memory. But say that this was, I don't know, 4 billion integers instead of just, you know, these three right here. Then it would be a huge problem to copy that entire list with all 4 billion values every time you make a function call right here. So as a default sort of shortcut, it just stores this list once. And instead, it just assigns a really cheap and easy to handle list reference to this variable. And then that list reference gets copied because it's just you know, a few bytes in memory. It just points to this what would be a gigantic 4 billion item list. And so that's a really computationally cheap thing for the computer to do. And that's why Python has that set up that way. Which is all well and good, but sometimes you actually might want to have a completely separate list. So how could you do that? Well, there's a module called the copy module. We can import that. And the copy module has a function called deep copy, which can make a total copy of this list. So it doesn't just copy the reference to this list. It actually creates a brand new list that just happens to have all the same values here. And it returns a, re a reference to this new list. 
So if we had, say, spam equals a list that has the letters A, B, C, D in it, and we wanted to copy that list and make a brand new copy, not just copy the list reference, we could call the copy modules deep copy function, pass spam to it. And what this does is it creates a brand new list based off of the values in this list and returns a reference to that new list. So now we can make all the changes we want to this cheese list because it's actually a separate list from the one in spam. So modifying cheese doesn't modify spam. That's kind of complicated. You might want to watch this video again just to go through why we have mutable and immutable data types and why we have references and the kind of tiny little bugs that can crop up if you don't quite understand what's happening with references. Uh, here's one more list concept that's fairly easy to understand. So in most cases, the amount of indentation for a line of code in Python tells what block it's in, but there's an exception to this rule. For example, list can actually span multiple lines of code. So if I had a list that was like right here, I could actually begin this on a brand new line. And Python's not looking at this indentation to say, oh, this code is, uh, this code must be in a separate block. Python is smart enough to realize, oh, you're still in the middle of typing out this list. You just wanted to make this code look a little bit more readable by having everything line up like this. And it'll consider that to be a single line of code. This in particular is nice because if you have several dozen values, you don't need to cram it all on one line that just starts wrapping around. You can just make your code a little bit easier to read. In fact, you can do this even when you don't have lists by using the slash line continuation character. Now this is not the same as the division operator slash, but rather it's, it's the opposite slash. So you could have code that says four score and seven, and then I'm concatenating this string, but maybe I'm when I'm typing this out in the file editor, I'm running out of space over here, or I'm making this line too long. I can just add this slash, And this line continuation slash character tells Python, okay, ignore the indentation on the next line. I'm just continuing this previous line. I'm not starting a new block or ending a block or anything like that. And then you can complete the rest of that Python instruction. We could have something like this. And this is basically the exact same as what this code does. It's just that line continuation slash says this line continues on the next line, so don't pay any attention to its indentation. To recap, strings can do a lot of the same things that lists can do. It's just that strings are in mutable data type. Immutable values like strings can't be modified, quote, in place. Uh, mutable values like lists can be modified in place. And variables don't contain lists they actually contain references to lists. So when you're passing a list argument to a function, you're actually passing a list reference. And changes made to a list inside of a function will affect the list outside of the function. And finally, the slash line continuation character can be used to stretch Python instructions across multiple lines.